the House Rules Committee met to discuss the creation of an investigative panel to examine U.S. technology transfers to China. The three-hour meeting begins with remarks by Committee Chairman Gerald Solomon. The committee will come to order. Uh, there are several items on the agenda this, uh, this afternoon. Uh, the first is uh, H. Res 463 from the Rules Committee to establish a select committee on United States national security and military commercial concerns with the People's Republic of China. Uh, we will uh, conduct a hearing uh, on this matter. We will then go to two other matters on the agenda. Uh, and then we will come back to the, uh, to the uh, markup of this, uh, this legislation. The, uh, before uh, we uh, go any further, the uh, uh, resolution uh, that is before us was introduced last Tuesday by myself, the chairman of the Rules Committee, and referred to, the, uh, to this committee. We are here today to answer one question, and that question is, how serious do we in the House take United States national security? How serious are we about protecting peace and security? Uh, and uh, certainly uh, ensuring the integrity of the United States security policy. Uh, are we serious enough to establish a special panel in this people's house devoted exclusively to examining the grave allegations about the United States relationship with the People's Republic of China. That's what we're here today for. Today we will examine in procedural and policy terms whether this committee thinks it appropriate to set up a select committee empowered with the tools necessary to get to these facts for the brief remainder of the 105th Congress to examine this matter. And let me uh, at this point just insert that uh, uh, in about two weeks, this Congress is going to go home for a work period uh, in July for about two and a half weeks. We will return, and then on August 6th or 7th or thereabouts, we will then take off five more weeks, in which we won't return until after Labor Day. Uh, and then, uh, this is an election year, and uh, members of Congress are entitled to go home, hopefully sometime around uh, the uh, October 5th, 6th, or 7th, uh, to do some campaigning uh, to, uh, for re-election. Uh, that leaves hardly any time at all uh, for this Congress to function uh, and certainly for this select committee to function. I point that out because this may be uh, lead to the way that we might establish this select committee. The select committee proposed to be created by this resolution will address an issue over which I personally have had many concerns for at least a decade, and that is the transfer of technology to communist China, which may have military value. One of the key types of exports that has been provided China with militarily useful know-how and technology is that of satellites. Unfortunately, I must admit that the policy of exporting satellites for launch on Chinese rockets began during the Reagan administration, and you all know that Ronald Reagan was my hero. There's no one in politics I have ever worshipped or admired more. Uh, in the wake of the uh, Challenger disaster uh, at the time, I immediately became a critic of this policy, as it obviously had the potential to transfer ballistic missile technology to a barbaric communist regime that possessed nuclear weapons. I continued to oppose the policy it was as it was perpetrated by the Bush administration, and over the years have offered and passed legislation designed to prohibit satellite exports to China. As a matter of fact, and many of you were here uh, at that time, uh, on June 13, 1989, nine days after the Tiananmen Square massacre, I introduced legislation, H.R. Uh, 2624, expressly prohibiting the export of satellites intended for launch on launch vehicles owned by Communist China, and, and when within days attached that amendment to a State Department bill, and it was overwhelmingly uh, passed in this House. To my dismay, the legislation was watered down 
with waivers which have been issued 13 times for the export of 20 satellites to China, three times by the Bush administration and 10 times by the Clinton administration. Until recently, my differences with Presidents Reagan, Bush, and Clinton have strictly been policy differences. But over the past few months, we have seen startling revelations that have brought us to this unfortunate point where we need this select committee to sort out what appears to be both a national security fiasco and a potential scandal. For starters, we know that the policy of exporting satellites has almost certainly contributed to the upgrading of Chinese ballistic missile capabilities. That's a fact. Indeed, in May of last year, the Pentagon issued a report that concluded as such. And this committee just recently this morning uh, received testimony from the General Accounting Office, which uh, verifies most of the facts that I'm speaking to in this opening statement. Bear in mind that the Chinese government is an unelected dictatorship with no regard for human rights or human life uh, whatsoever that has been engaged in a massive military buildup for a number of years now and currently has 13 nuclear-tipped missiles pointed at the United States of America. It is incomprehensible that we would deliberately assist such a regime with its missile capabilities, but that is what we have done, and we need a wholesale inquiry into the flawed decision-making process that led to this embarrassing and, I think, very dangerous mistake. Moreover, I have been appalled at recent reports that strongly suggest that there may have been motivations other than national security involved in the Clinton administration's decision on satellite exports to China. We, of course, know for a fact that after the Pentagon issued its May 1997 report and after the Justice Department convened a federal grand jury to investigate whether the Laurel and Hughes companies provided military sensitive information to communist uh, China, President Clinton, in February of 1998, issued another waiver for another Laurel satellite export to China. Those are facts. Laurel. We... Mr. Chairman, I think Laurel. it's Laurel. 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 you're right. We know from internal White House memoranda that the President and the National Security Advisor were aware of the Justice Department's concerns over another waiver for Laurel, but ignored those concerns as well as concerns of the Defense Department over the possibility of further assisting China's missile capabilities. We know that the White House was also keenly aware that Laurel supposedly stood to lose a lot of future business in China if it did not receive a rapid waiver in February of this year. We also know that the chairman and the CEO of Laurel is an intimate friend of the President's and in 1996 was the largest single contributor to the Democratic Party, according to the New York Times and the Washington Post. And we know that Democratic fundraiser Johnny Chung has admitted that during the same period uh, as all of the above, he received up to $300,000 from a Chinese military officer, all while Mr. Chung was funneling money into Democratic campaign coffers. What we don't know is whether and how all of this is connected. We also don't know the full extent of the national security damage done to the United States. Questions abound serious questions that threaten the very security of this nation and certainly uh, threaten the safety of our citizens. And since these questions cross the jurisdictional lines, and this is important for the members to understand, since these uh, questions cross jurisdictional lines of at least eight standing committees, it may be advisable that the House create a select committee, something that I am always hesitant to do. It will be possible to conduct a focused, an expeditious review of this matter in a smaller environment that many of the larger standing committees of jurisdiction provide. The proposed resolution defines the scope of the inquiry and sets forth the methods, the procedures, and the budgetary components of the select committee's work. And uh, much effort has been gone through with uh, Congressman Chris Cox, who is proposed to, uh, to uh, chair this select committee, and Norm Dix, uh, who is one of the most respected uh, and admired members of this body on the other side of the aisle from my own myself. Um, and uh, we hope that uh, we will have worked out all of the differences so that we can proceed here today. As the members of this committee are well aware, the Rules Committee is reluctant as an institutional matter to grant investigative procedures to committees beyond what currently are offered in the, in the House rules. 
we have to be very, very careful about that. However, in certain instances, such as the startling national security issues raised by this matter, the Rules Committee is willing to empower a committee with tools to get the job done, to get it done quickly, and to get it done effectively. The Staff Deposition Authority and the International Evidence Gathering Techniques contained in this resolution are consistent with House practices. We have guaranteed that and have been incorporated in at least 11 House resolutions since 1974. Other provisions in this resolution are modeled after the House resolution creating a select committee to examine the Iran-Contra affair in 1987. And since it is expected that this select committee will examine significant intelligence-related material, provisions governing the conduct of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. In my judgment, the existing committee system cannot sufficiently address a matter of this magnitude in the remaining days of this legislative session, as I have outlined uh, uh, the limitations uh, in the, the earlier on. I urge the members to support the creation of the Select Committee so that the American people can have some answers to questions about the formulation of U.S. security policy with regard to Communist China. Uh, that sort of sets the parameter of why we're here today, and Mr. Mokley, I'd be glad to yield to you for any opening statement you might have, and then we might get on with our witnesses. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mokley. Before this hearing goes any further, I want to remind my colleagues of our responsibilities. This committee, the Rules Committee, is here not to judge the merits of President Clinton's policies. The Select Committee will determine whether the policies are appropriate. This committee will determine how that Select Committee gets there. We're charged with creating a Select Committee, not beginning its work. We must make sure that the vast powers we bestow on the new committee are appropriate and will not be abused. Given the record, breaking numbers of partisan investigations this Congress is conducting. For those who aren't aware of it, there's 12 out of the 20 committees are currently conducting, conducting 41 investigations. Given the millions and millions of taxpayers' dollars trying to make Democrats look bad, and given the rampant abuse of power, I think it's time we made absolutely sure that we establish a select committee that will investigate the allegations it's created to look into. No more, no less. I think it's time we create an investigative committee that will seek the truth, not waste taxpayers' dollars seeking partisan advantages. I recommend that the select committee be structured so as to be absolutely fair to all. If the procedures are fair, if classified information is kept secret and witnesses are afforded due protections, the committee will not degenerate into a partisan bickering committee. I also recommend that the authority we grant the select committee be appropriate to its mission and not overly broad. That way, we can really avoid having another investigation that takes a life on of its own. Finally, Mr. Chairman, I urge my colleagues here and on the select committee to stick to the business in hand and rise above the partisanship that has so belittled, belittled this Congress. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Joe. And uh, let, me one, uh, let me, for one, pledge that, uh, that there will certainly be no partisanship as far as I'm concerned. Uh, one thing that we all have to be concerned about are headlines like this, New York Times to the Washington po Times to the Washington Post. This particular headline says, China assists Iran, Libya on missiles. New findings contradict White House. This is what we're here for. This is the danger that this country is facing down the road, not only today, but five or 10 or 15 years from now. And that's what I think we all have to be concerned about. Let me briefly yield to uh, my vice chairman, uh, Mr. Dreyer, for a brief statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And let me uh, say that I'd like to associate myself with the, the chairman's remarks. And uh, I, I do so uh, in an attempt to underscore a couple of points. First and foremost, uh, one of the tasks that I've been uh, given over the past two Congresses has been an, uh, been an attempt to try and uh, pare back the number of committees and subcommittees in the Congress. And frankly, we've done so with, uh, I believe, a great deal of success. But it's in that context that I believe that the developments that have come out over the past several weeks certainly warrant uh, the establishment of this select committee. And um, as was said by the chairman, the fact that we have eight standing committees, which 
would have jurisdiction over this uh, sort of effort. I think that it is warranted. And I would say to my friend from Massachusetts that the fact that there's so many investigations that have been taking place, I think, uh, underscore not the fact that we are simply trying to get at the Democrats, but we're trying to get at the truth here. And I think that that's the goal of the establishment of this, uh, of this select committee. And I'd also say that uh, in associating myself with the remarks of the chairman, I do so uh, as uh, one who has very, very passionately believed in the policy of the Reagan and Bush administrations and now the Clinton administration of engagement with China. And I think that that is uh, an important thing for us to continue. And I hope very much that we will, in utilizing that policy, be able to, uh, to use it to uh, get to the truth. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Thank you. And uh, if there are no statements on this side, the uh, chairman of the Intelligence Committee, a member of the Rules Committee, Mr. Goss, uh, would have a statement. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity. I really wanted to uh, respond a little bit to the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Mokley's comments. Uh, indeed, there are some investigations ongoing because national security is a very important uh, issue. And I can speak for uh, the Intelligence Committee on the House side, as I think Mr. Dix will agree with me, and say that we have, in fact, been doing our job and discharging the responsibilities of oversight under our portfolio and had gotten into this area, and this is somewhat of a new wrinkle on it. Uh, but I would not uh, say that just because we are doing our job in intelligence means that we are going to be able to work as efficiently or with such focus as a select committee could. And for that reason, I favor very much uh, setting up this select committee, because I know it is going to go uh, into areas that uh, are, are going to be beyond the bounds of what we would normally do in, in my committee upstairs. Uh, I also have found, and I want to assure the gentleman from Massachusetts, I could not be more serious about this. I was not prepared to come to this meeting or to talk to our leadership or to discuss with anybody the idea of a select committee until I was fully convinced that a select committee was needed and that there were serious questions out there that need to be answered. I am fully convinced that the select committee is the right way to do it, and I am fully convinced that there are serious questions that need to be answered. They simply have not... Uh, been possible to get the type of information we've needed to get uh, to answer some of the questions we've had in the Intelligence Committee. And as I said, some of these questions go beyond just our portfolio. The good news is the, co the administration has said that they will cooperate with us. I've had that reassurance very recently from a very high-level member of the administration, the appropriate person, to, to give us that message. And I believe that if we do have that cooperation, cooperation the um, Select Committee will be able to across all these committee jurisdictional lines with the cooperation of the administration and in the time allotted come back uh, with what I think will be the true situation of what has happened and what our situation is with national security. I, uh, I make those points uh, because I, I know that a lot of people are, are saying that, well, this is just one more, uh, one more political thing in a, in a political year. Uh, I am not uh, about to take away from my schedule for one more political thing in a political year. I think the gentleman knows me well enough to know that. I intend to go where the truth takes us, and I surely hope that the truth is going to take us there with the cooperation of all the people who uh, have to answer some of these questions that have now been raised. Having said that, uh, I think we're on the right track, and I see no reason to go backward. <laughs> Are there further uh, statements from uh, members? If not, um, we would then ask uh, Christopher Cox, who is chairman of, the, uh, of our policy committee, to come forward along with Norm Dix. Uh, they are the, uh, both the chairman, the proposed chairman and the uh, uh, ranking member of, uh, of this select committee, should it be formed. So if you two gentlemen would come forward. I will repeat one more time. Uh, the two of you are two of the most respected and admired members of this body. You both uh, uh, don't have a tendency to be emotional or excitable, like some of us perhaps. <laughs> And uh, therefore, um, that, that might be the reason that you've been selected to, uh, to take on this awesome responsibility. Um, Mr. Cox, if you would like to proceed, both of your statements would appear in the record uh, entirely without objection, and you may proceed, followed by, by Congressman Dix. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Moakley, other members of the committee. Uh, the reason that we are here to consider the creation of a select committee is largely on the public record. While much of what we propose to inquire into will in fact be classified, 
much of what we now know is the consequence of press reports. The media have done a good job in bringing matters to our attention, but there is a limit to what the media can do. The standards of journalism require that it be reported accurately what someone says, but the journalists do not have all the necessary tools at their disposal always to determine whether what someone says is the truth or fiction, uh, whether or not uh, it is all of the information or whether there might lie uncovered additional information. Uh, let us begin by reviewing the public record. And my discussion of apparently classified information will be in the context of what is clearly on the public record. In 1996, uh, People's Republic of China Long March rocket carrying a Loral satellite exploded shortly after liftoff. It was at least the seventh Long March rocket to fail. On April 4th, 1998, the New York Times, in a story by Jeff Gerth, first reported that a federal grand jury was investigating whether during the investigation of that 1996 launch failure, Loral and Hughes provided any information to the Chinese People's Liberation Army without the necessary State Department approval and whether such illegal acts may have advanced Chinese People's Liberation Army ballistic missile capabilities. According to the April 4 New York Times article, since this proposed export involved the transfer of the same kind of expertise that prompted the Justice Department to investigate in the first place, some administration officials claimed that the February waiver undermined the investigation. The Justice Department made these very concerns known to the White House prior to the February 1998 waiver. On April 13, the New York Times reported further that in May 1997, the Pentagon issued a classified report which concluded that Loral and Hughes provided information that, quote, significantly improved, close quote, China's missile capabilities. The New York Times reported on May 15, 1998, that a Chinese military officer, Lieutenant Colonel Liu Chaoying, funneled nearly $300,000 to Democratic Party fundraiser Johnny Chung. Lieutenant Colonel Liu is an officer of China Aerospace, a state-owned company integrally involved in China's satellite launching program. Lieutenant Colonel Liu was previously an officer of China Great Wall Industries and Precision Machinery, Inc., the manufacturers and sellers of M11 missile components to Pakistan. On May 23rd, the New York Times reported that on February 18, 1998, while the Justice Department investigation of Loral was ongoing, President Clinton issued another waiver for Loral to export a satellite to China. On June 1, 1998, the New York Times reported that the State Department also advised the White House prior to the February 1998 waiver that Loral's actions in 1996 appeared to be, quote, criminal and knowing, close quote, and that U.S. law might prohibit satellite exports to China in any event due to China's transfer of missile technology to Iran. The June 1st article also reported that the administration was aware of the Defense Department's concerns over possibly aiding the People's Republic of China's missile program, citing a February 12 memorandum to the President from National Security Advisor Samuel Berger. Also according to the June 1 article, and again citing internal White House and State Department memoranda, National Security Advisor Berger and the President were made aware of the fact that Loral stood to lose the contract and to incur a financial penalty if the waiver were not granted soon. Although the waiver was then issued shortly after the supposed deadline, the launch project was kept on schedule for November, and Loral did not incur any penalties from the Communist Chinese government. The press has also reported that the CEO of Loral, Bernard Schwartz, has become a close personal friend of the president and was the largest single donor to the Democratic Party in 1996. On June 10, the General Accounting Office testified before the Senate Intelligence Committee that President Clinton's March 14, 1996 decision to transfer ultimate control of satellite exports from the State Department to the Commerce Department diminished the ability of the Defense Department to block satellite exports for national security reasons. Until that 1996 decision by the President, the Department of Defense was routinely deferred to by the Department of State. 
Now, however, the Defense Department must garner a majority of agencies before it can block an export for national security reasons. In testimony before the House National Security Committee in November 1997, Commerce Department official William Reinch acknowledged that while some 47 supercomputers had been sold to the People's Republic of China, the U.S. government was unaware of their whereabouts. These supercomputers may be used for, among other purposes, simulating testing of nuclear weapons. 60 Minutes on CBS reported on June 7, 1998 that the People's Liberation Army illegally diverted enormous McDonnell Douglas aeronautics machine tools approaching the length of a football field for use in People's Liberation Army military aircraft production. McDonnell Douglas is now the subject of a grand jury investigating the diversion. All of these media reports give rise to a number of unanswered questions that will be the object of the select committee's focus. The questions with which our select committee will begin are these. First, has the reliability or accuracy of the People's Liberation Army's nuclear missiles been enhanced? If so, how did this happen? The select committee will make every effort to find the truth. I am heartened by the initial pledge of the administration to cooperate in our efforts to find the truth. Where the national security of the United States is at stake, withholding information from the Congress under the guise of preserving what the White House has already decided will be a compromised prosecution is not justified. Finally, I agree that a select committee is the most efficient way to consolidate the work of the various House committees that might have jurisdiction over these matters. Mr. Chairman, I have counted uh, not eight, but seven. There may be eight or nine uh, committees that uh, clearly have jurisdiction over these subjects. They are the Intelligence Committee, the International Relations Committee, the National Security Committee, the Science Committee, the Commerce Committee, the Government Reform and Oversight Committee, and the Judiciary Committee. These committees of the House of Representatives alone have 295 members. It will be a consolidation of investigation, not an expansion of it, to create this select committee and concentrate the inquiry uh, in a small membership with expertise in these subjects. We stand, as a consequence of creating such a select and focused committee, a much better chance of getting the truth expeditiously. The small size of the committee will also facilitate cooperation between and among members, who I intend to involve in all major decisions. Each member can, with this arrangement, be fully prepared. And since we will all have to meet during periods when the House is not in session, as the chairman uh, has outlined, uh, we have a number of recesses, holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and election, and so on, uh, we can assure, as otherwise we might not be able to assure, the full participation of all the members of the committee. Finally, our select committee will adopt rules virtually to those of the permanent select committee on intelligence. I anticipate that much of our work will have to be done in closed session. Our purpose is to enhance American security, not broadcast sensitive information to the world. As a result, this will not be political theater, but rather a sober and serious consideration of the alleged threats to our national security. To my right, sitting to my right, is the ranking member of the proposed select committee, Norm Dix. And, uh, we have had the opportunity in the last few days uh, to meet together. Uh, I can tell you from uh, having met with the minority leader, Mr. Gephardt, uh, on the subject of the creation of this select committee, uh, having observed his appointment of Norm Dix, having worked with uh, the ranking member on the Intelligence Committee, uh, that we have uh, every reason to expect that this will be precisely the kind of focused uh, and professional select committee that it is uh, the intention of this Congress to create. And, uh, and I believe uh, from listening to your comments, Mr. Solomon, Mr. Moakley, it is the intention of both of you to create. Uh, so uh, I want to thank you for this opportunity to appear as your witness and uh, express my willingness to answer any of your questions. Congressman <laughs> Cox, thank you very, very much. And before we get into questions, we'll certainly hear uh, the entire statement from uh, Norm Dix, who is the ranking member of the uh, uh, select Committee on Intelligence, and uh, uh, Norm, we always welcome you here. You're a lot of members that stand up for the national uh, defense of this country, and uh, that's one of the reasons 
Excuse me. Well, I hold your knife. Excuse me. Well, I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you and Mr. Moakley, first of all, for giving us uh, a few extra days after my appointment to have a chance to look at this resolution, uh, HRES 463, and uh, to have some opportunity to get to wor work with Chris Cox. And uh, I must tell you, as we're getting started, I think this relationship can work, and I think we can do a good job for the House. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm pleased to appear with Mr. Congressman Cox in support of the creation of a select committee to investigate issues relating to the transfer of technology between the United States and the People's Republic of China. Congressman Cox and I have had several meetings over the past six days to discuss the manner in which we want this select committee to function. I believe that we share a commitment to ensuring that this investigation is conducted in a manner which is fair and thorough and which brings credit to the House. We have provided you with some recommendations for changes in HRES 463 as introduced, which I believe will make it easier to make good on that commitment. I want to commend Mr. Cox for his willingness to consider my views on ways in which the rights of the minority to participate in the work of the committee can be better ensured. We have begun to forge this kind of working relationship, which will increase the likelihood that this resolution, the rules which the select committee will adopt, and the understanding which the two of us have reached and will reach are implemented fairly. We have a limited amount of time to review some complex and potentially contentious issues. At this point, I believe our inquiry needs to examine the following matters. First, we must review the policy, as the chairman said, devised under President Reagan and continued in the Bush and Clinton administrations to permit U.S.-owned satellites to be launched on foreign rockets particularly those of the People's Republic of China. Is this a sound policy which appropriately balances potential economic, technological, and national security risk and benefits for the United States? In this context, we need to examine changes in that policy and its implementation over the past decade. The second matter arises from the failed launch of a satellite undertaken pursuant to that policy and concerns whether in assisting the People's Republic of China in determining the cause of that failure, information harmful to the national security of the United States was transfer transferred to the Chinese by representatives of U.S. companies. And I might point out that that was done without the approval of the executive branch, and the executive branch has taken vigorous steps since, that, since the companies you know, made it clear to the State Department and Defense Department that they had acted inappropriately. Now, this is an area in which we must navigate carefully because legal proceedings are underway. But I believe the American people deserve as clear a determination as possible on the national security implications of this transfer of information. I would note that the Department of Defense and the Central Intelligence Agency apparently reached different conclusions on this question. So the task ahead of us will not be easy. Finally, must, we must examine whether money flowed into the political process in the United States from either domestic or foreign sources in an effort to influence federal decisions on technology transfers. In this matter as well, pending legal proceedings may affect our work. I might add, uh, I think that uh, the administration has made it clear that uh, it feels that it made this decision based on recommendations that came up from the bureaucracy and that no special uh, treatment was given to anyone. In fact, a lot of other companies besides Laurel were granted the same kind of waivers in order to, to uh, have satellites launched as Laurel re re received. Now, as I noted, Mr. Chairman, our committee will have a relatively short life, and there is much to do in that time frame. It is imperative that our effort be focused on matters of substance, and I will work toward that end. If it is the will of the House that a select committee be formed to conduct this inquiry, I would hope that the permanent committees, which have had aspects of this matter under investigation, will defer to the new committee. It will not assist us, nor will it justify the considerable amount of taxpayer funds being sought for our effort if we are to be but one of many investigations of the same information, involving the same documents and the same witnesses on these matters. I hope we can get the cooperation of the House in this area and all others which may affect our ability to do the job which HRES 463 uh, gives to us. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Moakley and members, uh, 
I think this is a very serious matter. Uh, I think that it warrants uh, this select committee. And I pledge to all of you that I will do everything I can to cooperate with Mr. Cox and that uh, our side will do everything we can to get to the truth and let the facts uh, be the determinant. And I also think, as the chairman suggested, this isn't partisan. We need to look at this policy to make sure uh, it was started under Ronald Reagan, who was probably the greatest defender of uh, this country that I can think of. Uh, uh, he started this policy, and now we may have to go back and reconsider it in light of what's transpired. So I think we need to uh, do this in a fair way. I think we need to keep partisanship out of it. Uh, and I think we can make some good recommendations to the House. Thank you. <coughs> After uh, listening to both of you, uh, uh, you renew my faith in this institution and make me, make me proud to be a member of this institution because um, we certainly have a lot of faith in, in the two of you. Uh, let me again just say that uh, the two of you working uh, with myself, with Mr. Moakley, with other members of the Rules Committee and our staffs, uh, uh, you have gone to great length to uh, make sure that uh, the establishment of the Select Committee be fair, be bipartisan, as a matter of fact, be nonpartisan. Um, whenever we, uh, we, we can. And uh, again, I want to commend you for that. I thought that we had had all of the, uh, the details worked out because, uh, as you said, Norm, we did delay the action uh, on the committee at your request and, uh, and uh, Congressman Cox's uh, and, and Mr. Moakley as well, uh, so that you would have, a, have time to really uh, evaluate the resolution. And again, I thought um, as of three hours ago that, that all the details had been worked out. We actually are incorporating into um, uh, the resolution all of your suggestions, both of yours, uh, and, um, and we have taken out other objectionable things uh, out of the resolution, uh, trying to make it as, uh, have as much comedy as we possibly can. But we do have to get into a little uh, detail because uh, we have talked about the fact that uh, uh, the, there are eight committees involved, 295 members, as you said, Norm, and there's no way that we can involve that many in this short period of time we have between now and December 31st. And therefore, uh, we are going to have to have special consideration in order to have uh, your committee of just seven, eight, or nine members uh, be able to, 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 to function. And uh, um, I know uh, I, for one, uh, when David Dreyer was, uh, along with Lee Hamilton, was heading up the reform of this Congress, I, for one, had uh, proposed and was successful in, uh, in abolishing proxy voting. Uh, and we have to, again, clarify what that was. As you all know that uh, previously uh, members of Congress could leave a blank proxy with nothing but their name on it. No date, no, uh, no bill number, no amendment. And then the chairman or the ranking member, majority or minority party, could vote those proxies. And I thought that was wrong. Members ought to be here in Washington. They ought to be doing their job. Uh, there is no way that you're going to be able to function under this tight uh, situation. And uh, consequently, we had, uh, at your suggestion, Norm and, uh, and Mr. Cox, uh, we had uh, arranged that uh, in the resolution to have a quorum consist of three members, that at all times, where, whether you be meeting here in Washington or in California or Oregon or Washington or wherever, the uh, state of Washington, that there would be at least three members in, uh, in attendance. And that uh, for you to make decisions, that you would have to have at least a majority of five casting a vote. Uh, that means that uh, uh, the only way to do that, uh, as I see it, is by uh, some kind of electronic device, uh, whereas you as the uh, chairman and you as the ranking member could contact the, uh, the other members by telephone, uh, could uh, converse with them, uh, whether it be through a conference call or whatever, and that, uh, that you then be able to uh, at least have their written uh, approval or disapproval, uh, but at all times having uh, at least a majority of those members uh, of, uh, of the total of seven, eight, or nine uh, being in unison on a, uh, you know, on a vote. Um, Mr. Moakley, I think, is going to raise some questions about that, but I think we need to have that discussion because I thought that in trying to accommodate both of your concerns that uh, this might be the only possible way that we could compromise it and make it work. Uh, therefore, uh, I think at this point, I, I might like to yield to Mr. Moakley for 
his input, and then we might better have a dialogue, see if we can't work this thing out. And I apologize to the audience for having to, to do this, but it's the only time that we can do it when we have everybody here. Mr. Moakley. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I admire your stance on uh, abolishing proxies, and, but I think you misspoke. Uh, the proxies that were allowed before must have had specific information on them to be accepted. They couldn't just be a blank. Would the gentleman it, yield? Yes. Um, as the gentleman knows, uh, those proxies were in the possession of uh, the both the majority yeah. and the minority uh, member. Uh, and uh, more often than not, they were blank, and then the chairman would fill them in. Uh, whether he consulted, I don't know, with the, uh, with the member, but uh, well, I know of many instances when there was no consultation and the members were in Chicago or Florida or well, Lens Falls, New York. That was an abuse of the proxy system. No, because but it was but it The was information customary. was supposed to have been filled in and then deposited with the chairman of the ranking Well, it was at all times. Yeah. Uh, it was filled in and deposited with the chairman, but, but usually five or ten minutes before the, uh, the vote took place. And, Go and Mr. Chairman, whether a fellow electrically communicates or calls in or gets up in a roof with some naval signals, it's still, if he's not there in person, it's still proxy. And I, I just think this is a very, very important select committee we're talking about establishing. And I just think we should absolutely have people present, the minimum number of people present, before uh, the, the, the committee is allowed to function. I, and I just don't no. think a telephone well, call or a fax machine or a, whatever you have, or a crystal radio, if you want to go that far. Well, the, gen enough. the gentleman, the, the points are well taken. Let me just uh, withhold for a minute. Uh, the points are well taken. And um, uh, we have to put the trust in the, uh, in the chairman and the ranking member. Certainly, if there's going to be something that is controversial, uh, there's going to be five members uh, in attendance before uh, any vote uh, is taken. And uh, if I were in their shoes, I certainly would insist on it. And I know that the two of them would cooperate in each, with each other in that, uh, in that situation. If it is a question of making uh, minor decisions, uh, this is what we're talking about. Let me first yield to the chairman and then to the ranking right. member for your input to tell us your feelings and what you think you need in order to be able to perform your, your uh, ch charge. Well, uh, first, I think that this is an interesting discussion. It touches on issues that uh, uh, Mr. Dreyer covered as the chairman of the Joint Committee on the Reorganization of Congress, uh, or the ranking member, whichever it was at the time. Uh, they were co-equal. Co-chairs. <laughs> Uh, and, they, and they abused the rest of the members of the committee. I was one of them. Yeah, we tried. And, and while these are fascinating issues uh, of uh, principal concern to this Committee on Rules, uh, I want to emphasize for all the members of the Rules Committee that insofar as the select committee to be created is concerned, the chairman and the ranking member have reached agreement. We don't disagree with one another. We have a proposal that we are asking you to accept. If the Rules Committee seeks to change it, if the Rules Committee seeks to fight about it, it is your prerogative to do so, but I don't want that to reflect on the comedy that we're developing on the select committee. Uh, the genesis of this uh, intellectual exercise uh, is that uh, our select committee resolution was patterned in this respect uh, on the identical provision uh, in the resolution creating the last select committee of this House, which was the Iran-Contra committee. Uh, in that resolution, the quorum provided for was one-third. Uh, the uh, ranking member of the select committee to be uh, asked of me uh, by way of accommodation that uh, we increase that number, change it from the president of the House. Uh, I agreed to that because I think it's important for us to involve the members in these decisions for precisely the reasons that Mr. Moakley just stated. Uh, we did, however, discuss the very real logistical problem that we're going to experience with such a small committee, uh, and particularly if uh, we also change the ratio as has been proposed, another thing to which uh, I think we should assent, uh, so that uh, uh, we just have a very little uh, room for uh, an illness or, or somebody not participating. Uh, if this committee is expected to meet over Thanksgiving, as I think it will be, if it's expected to meet over Christmas and Hanukkah and, and New Year's, as I expect it will be, if it's uh, uh, to meet uh, during the run-up to the election, 
uh, and we've got members who think that they need to be in their districts uh, for these things. I would not wish any of them to be considered un-American because they cannot uh, hop on a plane, fly back to Washington for some routine business of our select committee, which the ranking member and the chairman concur uh, ought not to require that. And so we have worked this out uh, between ourselves to our satisfaction. We recognize, however, that the province of the creation of select committees <coughs> is this committee, not us. So we are simply making this uh, recommendation in a cheerful way to, to you, uh, and I am uh, uh, pleased to go with the judgment of this committee. <laughs> Mr. Dix, why don't you uh, comment that Mr. Dreyer wants well, to Well, uh, the chairman has explained this just right. Uh, basically, we were trying to figure out a practical solution to this problem, and I was worried that having just three people for a quorum was not enough, and but, but I was willing to compromise on the idea that if we could get a majority, Three would have to be present. This is to do routine business. If you had to vote, if you had to, re, you know, you're going to report out the report. You have to have five, if, assuming uh, five four. And that's written in members. the resolution. And, th and and you'd have to have five present to do that major piece of work. But if you're just going to have routine transactions in the committee, you'd have to have three present yeah. plus two more uh, would have to be in. Uh, you know, uh, communications. At least facts, two more. Right, uh, to establish this. And we would try to get everybody. You know, if we, if we only had three there, we'd try to get the entire nine uh, involved, and, and then they could, we could have votes uh, from the six people who weren't there, uh, assuming three present, uh, to decide these issues, and the votes would be recorded, both positive and uh, negative and, and affirmative. And uh, I, I thought it was a, a fair way to do it. Now, I, and I, and I appreciated at the time that this was going to get into the question of proxies uh, voting, uh, but, but we felt this way where each member has to make a decision uh, and be recorded and they're not giving the, the authority to the chairman or the ranking member to vote for them or to establish a quorum for them. They have to agree to that. So I thought it was a practical way to deal with the problem since we are going to only be around here for six months. And uh, we're going to, a lot of the time, we're not going to be in session. So that's why I agreed to it. And it also well, established the principle of five people for a quorum. And as I recognize Mr. Dreyer, let me, uh, let me just say that uh, uh, if it were not for the <clears throat> extenuating circumstances, uh, I, for one, would, uh, would be opposed to this sort of arrangement. Uh, but uh, considering the, the circumstances, I just don't see any other way. And we would like to go on record, uh, whatever happens in this Rules Committee, that uh, this is not establishing a precedent uh, for any other committees or any other standing committees, any other select committees, uh, that uh, we, would, uh, we would be very hesitant about, about doing this for anyone if it were not for you two gentlemen, the, uh, the comedy that you two share, uh, and the extenuating circumstances that exist. Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me uh, first uh, compliment both of you for working so closely together to try and address this. And uh, let me make a couple of comments and then explore an idea that I think uh, might be worth uh, considering. First, um, I don't know that I would necessarily want to use the existence of the Iran-Contra Committee as really a model for this, because clearly we, we are looking at uh, a new Congress, and we've made a heck of a lot of changes uh, since in the operations of the Congress since that time. So uh, I, I do think that we ought to look at it in possibly a little more creative way uh, now. I am very troubled at the prospect of in any way moving back to proxy voting. I, uh, we've never had it in this committee. There are a number of other committees where uh, it, uh, it does not exist, and I think that, frankly, it's worked out quite well. About two years ago, um, I had the opportunity as uh, chairman of one of the subcommittees of this committee of holding the first interactive uh, committee hearing completely. I mean, we were online, we had teleconferencing, it was carried by C-SPAN and all, and, uh, and it was successful. But one thing was very uh, uh, interesting on it. Uh, Scott McGinnis was one of the members of the committee who participated very actively from a college in Colorado, and yet based on the rules of the House, he was recorded as being absent uh, because he wasn't actually sitting there physically. And what I'd like to explore is the idea of, rather than having proxy voting, uh, using the computer, uh, using teleconferencing, or even an audio, uh, just a telephone uh, conferencing system, so that, in fact, members were participating 
Uh, and then the modification that I would propose is that if they're participating in that way and under these extraordinary circumstances where uh, you may be holding meetings outside of Washington or members have the exigencies of their campaign schedule or family commitments or whatever, whatever uh, might be, uh, that they could in fact be recorded as uh, present and participating in those decisions. You could still have the requirement that, uh, that you have uh, a certain number of members physically present but that members would participate and it would not be considered proxy voting because they would be uh, staying just as if they were there. But due to the technological changes that we've seen over the last uh, several years, I think that it does afford us sort of a unique opportunity here. That is, in fact, the proposal that is now before the Rules Committee. Uh, uh, Norm and I discussed, uh, mm -hmm. however briefly, proxy voting, and both of us rejected it out of hand. Mm -hmm. uh, the fundamental distinction between proxy voting and uh, well, this talks about the, the consent of decisions in writing is the way the resolution I understand, but let, and, and you ought to draft it any way you yeah. feel uh, well. uh, it should be drafted, but let me tell you what I think is our meeting of the minds. Uh, a proxy vote is one that is cast by someone else for you. Right. Uh, what we're talking about is diametrically opposed to that. We're talking about people on this committee casting their own votes mm -hmm. uh, after uh, actually participating uh, in the deliberations so that uh, we would have a nice uh, bridging of uh, the traditional and the new uh, with uh, the one-third quorum requirement, which is traditional for the select committee, uh, physically present and there. Mm -hmm. Other people in addition. This is just uh, on top of what is uh, required in the resolution creating the last select committee, but participating by telephone conference call and faxing in their vote so there's some written record. But that's the kind of thing that we have in mind. Mm -hmm. If the, uh, if the gentleman would yield, that is exactly uh, what we're proposing here uh, with the additional uh, addendum that uh, that, uh, that telephone conversation uh, by voice uh, would be followed up and ratified by a, uh, by a written consent, uh, either faxed and then followed up with, a, with an actual uh, uh, signature. And that's well, we should a, try not to use the word proxy voting at exactly. all. Exactly. No, and in fact, I, I, well, I, I risk uh, speaking uh, for not only myself, but the uh, able and ranking member who can speak for himself uh, at my elbow. But I believe that uh, we are both opposed to the idea of proxy voting in our committee. Absolutely. Isn't that correct? Yeah, absolutely. We, I, we've never used okay. it in... Well, I think we all agree. My, my hope was ahead, that we'd get up, we'd, we'd have a, a real majority of the committee to, in order for a quorum to be established. Yeah. And the only way we could figure out how to do it was three present and then hopefully involving the other people by telephonic communication or using uh, television, whatever, whatever computer, whatever way that we could figure out to do it. And I also don't want to create uh, an impression other than that uh, both of us, uh, the Democratic and Republican sides, are going to expect complete and total participation yeah. of the members on this select committee. This is uh, uh, a selection that will be made by the leadership of the House, the Speaker and the Minority Leader precisely. Uh, on the basis that uh, these are members who are expert and able to participate. So uh, we are going to be asking a heck of a lot of these people. They will be physically present for uh, uh, virtually all of it. We're talking only about an exigency. If I, uh, if I could just point out to my, my good friend, Mr. Mokley, the former chairman of this committee, that both of you in your testimony talked about routine uh, business decisions. Right. Um, if, you, if there were major decisions, major controversial decisions, um, you have both told me that you would insist that uh, members be there in person and right. that you would only conduct business uh, when there was, if it were serious matters other than routine uh, con conduct of business. Is that correct? That's certainly my, in my, uh, my, that's what my I understanding thought. and our intention and okay. our agreement. I mean, we've, we have worked out, we've gone through all these issues, and mm -hmm. we'd like to have a majority there present and voting. Well, I'd like to see all nine members there on anything of serious yeah. Least, Mr. Moakley, did you have any further comments? No, the uh, only thing, Mr. Chairman, is you know how I feel about proxies. I feel the same way you do about them. Exactly. I just didn't want to see the ugly head of a proxy reintroduce itself in, in, in the select committee. If, uh, if there is actual conversation and, and the person votes for himself however it's done, um, that probably would come close to satisfying what I'm looking for outside of having mm -hmm. the three there in person. But you'd then need five in person to conduct business. Just routine Maybe. business. If, if we're going to make a major decision, I mean, amazing. Yeah. You got to have a majority right. there. You got to have five there at present. All right. If it's nine, if Mr. Mokin, let me uh, let me assure you that uh, from now to December 31st, uh, there will be no proxy voting uh, in this Congress as long as I'm chairman of this committee. 
Uh, after that, we'll leave it up to Mr. Dreyer and his, uh, his new 20th, 21st century uh, innovations. <laughs> uh, let me just point out also that, uh, Mr. Moakley, and you're aware of this, that uh, three Republican chairmen and two ranking uh, Democrats have uh, asked us to reinstate proxy voting, and we have refused to do so, and we will continue to do so with your help. Mr. Goss, any other questions of the witness? Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was looking for a, a proposed budget on this committee, and uh, is there one available? I know that I know that the Mr. Hall, would you uh, withhold for one minute? Uh, if there are no other questions of the witness other than Mr. Hall, and if yours are going to be on that subject, I was going to ask Mr. Thomas to join the panel uh, because he is uh, money bags. He is the one that <laughs> controls the uh, the funding. And uh, perhaps he could enlighten us, and then the two of you could have further ask questions. Uh, Mrs. Oh, Mrs. Slaughter, would you? I, I have one, but not about budget. Well, would you, Mr. Hall? Would you like to withhold and let you, Louise answer her question Hall. first? Sure. Right. Thank you, Mr. Very Hall. Much. Will withhold. Mrs. Slaughter is recognized. And, and, and Mr. And Thomas, would you come forward? Pull up the chair over here, Mark. Members only. I, I just have a, a point I'd like to clarify. Sure. You're going to stay. <laughs> this is uh, to either one of you gentlemen, either Mr. Cox or Mr. Dix. Uh, I was uh, concerned about a clause, uh, Section 9. Uh, as I understand it, you're recommending that depositions well, and affidavits under oath can be taken by a single well, What page member. are you on, Louise? Ms. Ms. In Section 9. Uh, I don't have the page number in front you of me. you got a page number for the bill? That you will uh, allow a single member or staff to do that work, and I, uh, the House rules right now require two members to be present. And I would hope that Mr. that would, that would uh, be the case. Uh, what, uh, what do you need? I could respond. Okay. Uh, Mr. Cox and I have talked about this, uh -huh. and we have an agreement that there will be an opportunity for the minority to be present uh, at any deposition taken. In other words, we will be given a you chance. Will, you will confer on, on depositions and affidavits. Right. But uh, is it correct that you will allow staff to do it alone? Or do you, will you that have would, a member? Uh, in effect, uh, I think what That's right. Norm is saying is that that would be at the election of all the members not to attend. Uh, because any member could attend any deposition. Okay, but I know the House rules do require at least two members, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that you will adhere to that. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Uh, just one. Uh, do you intend, Mr. Chairman, and to be, and do you intend to have these hearings in an open or a closed fashion? Uh, well, as I alluded to in the opening statement, I do believe that a good bit of the information that will be called upon to evaluate will be classified and it ought not to be the purpose of this committee to do anything other than get to the facts. Uh, only when uh, a public hearing is the fastest way to get to the facts will we use that form. Uh, alternatively, conducting interviews, uh, reviewing documents, and so on uh, will be the uh, normal mode of operation. And will you be having those hearings in, just here in Washington, or do you tend to move? Or, or, uh... Uh, well, uh, quite frankly, uh, I don't know that we've agreed on that because we don't uh, okay. uh, have uh, a committee yet with, with which to discuss it. Uh, I, I believe that we may be able to have our first uh, committee hearing uh, as early as Thursday evening, at least organizational meeting uh, uh, Thursday evening, uh, if that's when we're completed with floor action and the speaker and minority leader cooperate by publicly naming And the intent members. is to produce and report on a final, have a vote on the final report? Yes, yes, by all means. Absolutely. That is one of the things that we have agreed uh, right. uh, should be uh, uh, absolutely participatory uh, uh, for all of the members. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, did that uh, answer your question, Louise? Uh, Mr. Frost, before we get into funding? You're right? I, I have a I'm sorry, it's out of the room. This may have already been covered. Okay. You're recognized, sir. But I would like to ask. Um, this uh, involves, this uh, deals with the question of, uh, Disclosure of information. I don't know. Did we were there questions asked about this no. Uh, already? No. no. Uh, this is, of course, an important issue because of what happened with the Burton Commission, Burton Committee, as you may recall, uh, involving the uh, 
uh, telephone calls that were taped of uh, uh, an individual who was in prison, and uh, those uh, telephone calls were subsequently released by that committee. Um, I notice on, uh, on page 7 uh, of the uh, draft resolution, HRES uh, 463, procedures for handling uh, information. And it talks about, this is subsection A, it says, no member of the select committee shall disclose any information, the disclosure of which requires a committee vote, prior to a vote by the committee on the question of the disclosure of such information, or after such uh, vote, except in accordance with this section. Now, the question is, of, uh, are we talking about a majority vote of the committee? How many people would have to vote uh, to have information disclosed? Uh, majority of a quorum. Gentlemen, withhold just for a minute. Uh, Mr. Goss might want to respond to that, but that whole section we respond that refers to classified information. Well, in fact, the part that Mr. Frost just read I don't believe it does. Uh, covers non-classified information. Yeah, the, the, no. Later on, it talks about classified. I believe the section that I'm talking about is, is any information. But uh, the Where chairman is correct that the entire section uh, and all of the rules that are laid out in this resolution uh, come verbatim from the rules of the House concerning the handling of information by the Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. And it is our object to follow those very well-known rules here. And so unlike uh, the procedures that were adopted, uh, especially for the purpose of the Government Reform and Oversight Committee, uh, these rules will be the rules of the Committee on Intelligence. And uh, uh, the answer specifically to your question is that uh, actions of the committee, QUA committee, will be taken uh, by majority vote of a quorum. By major I'm sorry, by majority vote? Of a quorum. Of a quorum. And so a, and a quorum is how many? Uh, you'll have to answer that question to me. It's the one part of these rules that uh, you are discussing right now, and it's gone through several drafts today. Uh, but whatever you determine is a quorum, uh, it shall be, and a majority of a quorum, just as is the case on Not a majority of the committee, but a majority of a quorum? Well, okay. There is a difference, of course. Uh, it is a majority vote of those present in voting uh, under the normal rules, uh, a minimum being a quorum. But now, if all nine members show up, then we know. No, that, but if a uh, quorum, for example, if a quorum is three, mm -hmm. then it would only take two, two of the three people present. If the other members elected not to participate, that's correct. Okay, I'm just, I just want to be clear on this. This is an important point because this is where uh, Mr. Burton ran into some trouble. Uh, and if, for sake of argument, a quorum is three, then only two of those three people would be required to vote to disclose information. Now, granted, you have a procedure for giving notice, yes. so everybody would be noticed. To, yes, uh, and this is a very different procedure than the one that is in place in the Government Reform and Oversight Committee. There, it was not uh, the determination of the full committee. Here, it will be the determination of the full committee, and the only uh, ultimate determinant of the number of votes required will be uh, the volition of members, uh, whether they choose to show up uh, at I a understand. notice meeting or not. I understand. Now, my, uh, as a follow-on question, because there was some con question about uh, uh, electronic devices. Uh, would, you, would this meeting be done by conference call, or would people have to be present in person uh, for this meeting where a decision, where a vote would be taken on releasing information? But again, this is subject to your judgment here today. But if we uh, go with uh, what uh, the ranking member and I have suggested, then uh, a minimum of one-third of the committee, the quorum requirement from the last select committee, would have to be there uh, physically mm -hmm. present, and additional members could then participate once a quorum was formed by the physical presence of that minimum. Okay, and I, uh, Mr. Chairman, the reason I'm asking these questions is that I take seriously our responsibility dealing with procedure. And while there are a lot of things that are going to be said today here that go to the merits, of this particular matter, the merits will be determined by this select committee. And our job is to make sure that the procedures uh, establishing the committee and that the committee operates under a fair. And uh, that, that's why I'm, I'm dwelling on these particular issues. Yes, sir. My understanding, I know we, want, we certainly want to get this straightened out, would be that you'd have three physically present. But in order to establish the quorum, you'd have to get two additional exactly. via the telephonic mm -hmm. communication in order to establish a quorum of five, mm -hmm. as I understand this, and I certainly would Is like to Chairman, then the majority of the quorum then becomes what? If you've got three. two on the phone and three in present, what does the majority I would think a majority there would be three out of five. And it is, and that was the intent of the legislation. Uh, in fact, I stand corrected. That is the language that uh, 
was most recently agreed upon. Some of this uh, is very recent. It's just today. All right. Hearing. But a majority uh, listen, listen up, because this is important now. Go on. See, and that's a vast improvement from my perspective, I think, in order for us to, to try to get to a quorum on most so, issues of five three, rather than three. All right. All right. Well, that raises it from the two that he was just told. The other thing is that we have a five-day notice here, too, as, as Mr. Frost pointed out. Yeah. And I think if there's anything serious going on, we'll be able to get people here clearly for that. Well, uh, if I may pursue this a little bit further, uh, is there any guarantee that uh, that there would be a minority member uh, in this counted in this five? Because if I understand correctly, uh, this is a committee that would be five from the majority and uh, and perhaps three or four from the major from the minority. That's not entirely clear as to the exact number of the right. committee, but but there would clearly be five, at least five majority members on this committee. Right. So that you is there any guarantee that you have to have at least one minority member uh, present to constitute the quorum, or could it be just the five majority members? Well, of course, the well, answer it is regular uh, rules of the house. It depends upon uh, <laughs> uh, the participation of the minority members, but uh, because of the ample notice requirements that well, uh, I give you my word that there will be a minority member present. <laughs> that's, that's why he's here. <laughs> I hope, well, I well, well said. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, and, I, and I'm sorry, did, you may have addressed this when I was out of the room, that uh, this uh, composition of the select committee uh, is changed from eight to nine or fewer. Did, is it going to be nine? Do we know? Uh, that is uh, up, up to, to the we're working this out. speaker okay. and the minority this is, We're being worked out between the speaker, the minority leader, and Mr. Cox and myself. If it were nine, is the assumption that it would be five and four? That's a good assumption. <laughs> Do we know, Mr. Cox? Uh, that, that's, that's the current thinking. That we don't know, but uh, I don't think I'm uh, disclosing state secrets here if I tell you that uh, what we're working towards is uh, uh, compressing that ratio so that it is as narrow as can be, either 5, 4, 4, 3. Okay. The, the, the reason that uh, these questions about disclosure are important, not only uh, because of what happened with the Burton Committee, but that a lot of this work will be done at times when Congress is not in session, as you've already indicated. And uh, the question is how you make sure you have enough members present to ensure that everything is done fairly. Um, I, I gather that uh, a fair amount of this work would be done during the August recess, and perhaps even uh, in October uh, after we recess for or adjourn for the year. Is that correct? correct? That's right. And November. And November and December uh, until the Congress expires. <coughs> the life of this select committee, in fact, is not fixed in this resolution. It's a function of the life of the Congress which creates it, the life of the Select Committee being coextensive with the life of the Congress. We recently have had, Mr. Cox, uh, quite a bit in the press about disclosures of matters that uh, may or may not have uh, taken place before a grand jury and the, and the propriety of those disclosures by the people involved. Um, that's why this disclosure section, of course, is very, very important. And um, are there any, uh, does your resolution contain any sanctions against people who disclose information without a vote of the committee that would that act improperly? The rules that we are preparing to adopt, the rules of the Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence contain, uh, I think, what have proven to be very workable such provisions, and uh, we would propose to adopt just those. And, and, and what are they? I'm sorry. Uh, that, in fact, uh, there is uh, 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 both uh, discipline uh, within the committee and referral to the Ethics Committee. Would this apply to staff also? Yes. Yes, it applies to members and staff. Well, we all want this to be done in a very professional and serious manner. And uh, both of you are, are serious members. And I think these are the type of questions that need, need to be addressed up front at the beginning of the proceeding. Because uh, certainly there will be people in the press who will be attempting to uh, obtain information from your committee. Uh, perhaps we without a vote. Even though we have anything secret thus far to disclose. Wait, wait, perhaps without even a vote of your committee. And uh, I hope that you will uh, uh, adhere to the procedures uh, very seriously and strictly. We're using, by the way, also from the Intelligence Committee, the Ethics Committee will, any, anyone who, who dis improperly discloses classified information, and one thing that we're going to be very tough on, and we both agreed to this, is protecting any classified information that comes to this committee. 
but it will be any violations of that will be turned over to the Ethics Committee, and they're so stated here in the rules. Of course, of course, Norm, this goes to not just classified information, as we've just been discussing. There's other information, too. Uh, the first part of this addresses, which would uh, include uh, non-classified information, but uh, information that your committee perhaps would not have taken a vote to disclose, and someone might uh, feel feel it's in their interest to disclose that information. I think there are two reasons that we should have uh, enormous confidence in the ability of this select committee to uh, uh, perform uh, as you've described, Mr. Frost. Uh, the first is the uh, actions by the minority leader and the speaker in appointing uh, serious members to the committee, including uh, apparently uh, both the chairman and the ranking member uh, of the Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. Uh, I don't know whether Mr. Goss will in fact be appointed, but that's been rumored. Uh, if we have uh, uh, both the chairman and the ranking member of the Intelligence Committee on our very small panel, and uh, second, we adopt uh, the very same rules governing uh, the Intelligence Committee for the handling of classified information, then I think we can expect uh, the full cooperation of the administration uh, in providing that information to the Congress, and that's very important for our Select Committee to function. And I'm, I'm going to do everything I can, working with the chairman, to try and, and, and set a standard that we are not going to be a committee that leaks, that our members, we're going to talk seriously to our members about not leaking information to the press without the approval of the committee as laid out in these rules. And, uh, and also on the staff. We're going to try to, and Mr. Goss and I have tried to do that, and I think overall we've been pretty effective up there in the, in the Intelligence Committee. Um, I think we do a lot better than other entities in terms of protecting information and not leaking information to the press. Mm -hmm. This Until is we have a formal vote of the committee on a report, hopefully at the end of the year. And, and I'll conclude my uh, questions in just a moment, but I think these are all important questions, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, this is particularly important because uh, this resolution would give you the authority uh, to inspect and receive 10 years' worth of tax returns. And the question is, how will those tax returns be treated by your committee? Will they uh, be treated as uh, classified information? Will they be treated as non-classified information, but which would require a vote of the committee to, uh, uh, to disclose? The committee rules are going to have to establish that, I believe. But I think the chairman and I are both going to want to make Majority sure that these are treated like classified information are treated. Would the gentleman yield? Yes, sure. Uh, and I think the, uh, the agreement was that, uh, that it would require a majority vote of those present dealing with tax matters. That was part of uh, our agreement. Yes, we, we have, right. we have exactly treated right. uh, even the request for that information separately from other matters uh, within the purview of the select committee. And all of this right. discussion that we've had about uh, forum requirements and so on uh, does not apply to, and, uh, to that. Mr power of the Select Committee. Right. And Mr. Frost, uh, you called attention to uh, <laughs> Section 9. And if you just open up your, your Section resolution. Seven. Uh, Section 7. Well, go, go to Section 9 on page 12, where it talks about information gathering on line 17. And then you go over to page 13 on line 5, where it talks about subpoenas, depositions, and interrogatories. And then you go over to page 14, where it talks about the handling of information at the very top on line 1 says information attained under the authority of this section shall be considered as taken by the select committee in the district of columbia as well as the location actually taken and, and this is the important part considered to be taken in executive session and that does require a majority vote if that information is going to be under house rules as the gentleman knows yeah, so if, I, if I, I just could, wanted to point that out to you if i could just ask uh, one other question and this again may have been already covered um, at what point would your committee be holding open hearings, and what point would they be uh, holding closed hearings? Uh, what again, the our, criteria model, for that? Uh, our model for this uh, will essentially be the Intelligence Committee. It's the reason that we're adopting the Intel Committee rules. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the reason that the uh, resolution sets out uh, in full text the rules of the House concerning uh, the Intelligence Committee. The uh, uh, Intelligence Committee conducts uh, uh, public hearings as well as uh, uh, closed hearings, uh, and it's entirely dependent on, on the subjects. But to the extent that uh, we are dealing with non-secret information, there is no reason in the world that uh, we should keep the uh, uh, public from knowing what we're doing. We're not intentionally being secretive. We are simply being circumspect. 
the uh, I've never had the uh, personal experience of serving on the Intelligence Committee so that I'm not familiar with how often the Intelligence Committee conducts public hearings. Does this uh, occur well, very often? I think it's it's a it's about I would say five to ten percent somewhere in that range a, a public year or are public you know 90 to 95 percent of what we do is uh, is closed if the if gentleman will allow me uh, if you'll, uh, let, let me say that two things are the taking of testimony and an uh, in executive session and what the consequences are of the leakage of that in the past several years in this institution. And we have corrected the Ethics Committee rules. This institution has done that. And those rules now work any better way. The second thing we have done is we have clarified for the members who serve on these committees the consequences of that kind of leakage so that the defenses that have been used successfully in the past about ambiguity or fail to understand are no longer valid. I think it's crystal clear that the rules of this select committee as they are laid out, not the rules we're doing here to authorize it, but the rules of the committee will make it very clear that there will only be a, a spokesman or two for the committee and that information will only be released through the spokesman. That's customarily the way these things happen. The second thing I can tell you is I am not aware of any problems at all with the procedure the uh, House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence has had with regard of protecting classified information and the sanctions for the violation of that, with one exception because of an ambiguity, <coughs> alleged ambiguity at the, at the Ethics Committee, which has now been taken care of. So I believe we've got both classified taken care of, unclassified taken care of, uh, and absolute controls so that the leadership of the select committee uh, will be the people who call the shots on what is public, what is private, and what is disclosed and when it's disclosed. I, I don't see any problem in that, and I read it very closely uh, with those thoughts in mind because I, I think very much as the gentleman from Texas does. I thank you for yielding. But I, I thank you, and the, uh, I would only suggest that this matter, the matter being dealt with by this particular select committee, uh, will be the subject of much more intense media scrutiny than most matters dealt with by the Select Committee on Intelligence. If the gentleman will further yield, I, I served on a select subcommittee not so long ago that was subject to some very intense scrutiny as well. And I found that the rules that uh, are going to be used in this select committee are, go are very close to the rules we used in our subcommittee. We had no uh, consequence problem in that or leakage problem that I'm aware of. At least Mr. Cardin would agree with me on that, I think. And um, I, therefore, I'm, I'm willing to say I think we've got it right. Thank it, you is, it is, from a public standpoint, it is important that there be complete confidence on the part of the public in this particular, the work of this committee, and that um, um, that will be a real challenge for these for the members of this committee uh, to deal with the press on this issue. And I thank you very much. Um, if we could, uh, I'll go to Mrs. Mark and then back to Mr. Paul. We'll take it back and forth. Mrs. Mark. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just simply wanted to say that um, I need to talk about this. Yeah. Uh, Use your mic. <laughs> it is important. Push the button. Use the. Uh, I am pushing both buttons. <laughs> push the other button. Why don't you come sit over here? All right. <laughs> I'd like to change my seat. Mrs. Slaughter, the light's now in my eyes. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Now, Porter, we're going to really find Sorry out. Sorry for the delay here. <laughs> Thank you, Porter. Okay. Mrs. Myrick, you have the floor, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you. I, w I just, um, because of the questions that have been asked today and the seriousness of the matters you're going to be dealing with, I would hope that uh, you two would uh, relay to the speaker and the minority leader. I think it's imperative that the people that you choose on this committee be aware of the fact that it's really important they be at the meetings, unless it's a personal illness or a family matter or something. But, you know, get a commitment from them ahead of time. They're going to attend the meetings because otherwise there are probably other people who could. And I'm just saying that because everybody seems to be really concerned about that, and I am too. And I think to truly do it justice, be nonpartisan and nonpolitical and all the other things, that's an absolute necessity. Thank you. <clears throat> and now Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I wanted to ask a question or two about the budget of the committee. And, and um, is there a breakdown of what you intend to spend 
$2.5 million on? Mr. Thomas, uh, I know we've got other witnesses here, uh, and Mr. Wolsey in particular had uh, another commitment, but uh, why don't we let Mr. Thomas uh, testify? He might answer some of your questions, then you can pose the questions. Is that all right, Tony? Okay, Mr. Thomas, uh, you have the floor, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Could I ask unanimous consent to address myself to one topic that came up earlier, just very briefly? You may And it has proceed. to do with the voting when you are not physically present in the room. Uh, I would hope that you would work with uh, the Oversight Committee and others in dealing with the best available method, yes. because quite frankly, this is going to be looked at as to whether or not it might be a successful model for other committees. And I would hope that we try to give it uh, the best chance of success. Secondly, you're probably going to have to work with the House Council and others because I can envision a situation in which a majority of the votes to pass something were not physically in the room. And you had better make sure from a point of view of what's binding and not. Those are just a couple of points. Uh, otherwise, it sounds intriguing, and I look forward to seeing how it might work. We are in the process of doing that right now, Bill. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, in uh, direct uh, answer to the gentleman from Ohio, I've just uh, handed the chairman of the uh, Rules Committee a letter from myself as chairman of oversight, indicating that certainly we have the jurisdiction as far as uh, any funding is concerned for all committees in this one, but we've uh, allowed it to be done at one time to expedite the process. On page 17, line 11 of the proposed resolution, uh, there is a statement about the budget, not more than $2.5 million. Uh, prior to the appointment of the ranking member, Mr. Cox and others uh, sat down with us and we put together a kind of a model budget where we would attempt to see what an allocation of 2.5, uh, uh, not more than $2.5 million, uh, would be appropriate both with joint committee majority and minority. That was for illustration purposes only. And my understanding now is that, in fact, the chairman and the ranking member are going to sit down and uh, resolve the way in which uh, that money is to be expended. We, of course, will exercise uh, our uh, jurisdictional power over that with uh, great willingness to, within the outside boundaries of the budgetary amount, accommodate any particular interests uh, or concerns that the select committee might have. Uh, I have a, a lot of material, Mr. Chairman, I would make a part of the record in terms of putting this amount of money in perspective. I do think one of the more appropriate ways, uh, just in a single comment, since the Iran-Contra Committee has been mentioned several times, if you were to take the dollar amounts that were appropriated or authorized for Iran-Contra and in uh, 98 constant dollars, uh, that would have been, in fact, a budget for 2.9. Uh, million. This is uh, 2.5 in current dollars, so obviously about $400,000 less than, less than had been authorized uh, for the Iran Contra. So it is not out of line. The concern about six months <laughs> left uh, should be understood in the context of the statements made by both the chairman and the ranking member that uh, this select committee does <coughs> not intend to follow a normal calendar in pursuing information prior to. Uh, the final day of the 105th Congress. And so I would uh, urge that we provide maximum leeway within that uh, maximum amount for them to determine how they might best allocate the dollars. <coughs> Without objection, all of your uh, material and your letter that you okay. just submitted will, ap will appear in the record. Uh, Mr. Hall. I would simply point out that uh, $2.5 million to be spent in six months is a lot of money. I remember when we had uh, four select committees about four, four and a half years ago. And um, in one year, the most expensive of that select committee was $1.2, $1.3 million. We're going to spend probably close to it, $2.5 million in, in, uh, in six months. Of that of those four select committees, the least amount spent was $600,000, a committee in which I chaired. And I, I just, we've spent a lot of money on investigations. And to spend $2.5 million in six months appears to me to be a, a tremendous amount of money. There's, there's a humdrum in the, uh, in the room if people would assist from talking. And uh, Mr. Hall, go ahead. No, I asked Mr. Thomas. I um, I appreciate the gentleman's concerns. 
Uh, the stated amount is not <coughs> more than 2.5. It doesn't say you get to spend 2.5. We will be overseeing how that money is spent. However, I do think you have to take into consideration the type of committee that we're creating. Uh, it is um, a zero startup. It is not a committee in which you can use any table and X number of chairs with a witness on the other side. Given the model that they're using, uh, the Intelligence Committee, you're going to have a number of documents that have to be handled a particular way. You'll be uh, dealing with the necessity uh, to purchase or at least equipment of a um, relative national security standard level, which isn't necessary with most committees. We've already begun to work with them as to where they might be able to acquire the kind of a secure uh, phone lines, fax lines, uh, uh, other lines that are necessary to maintain the standard of secrecy that they have held themselves to. You can't just say it. You have to create an environment in which that is possible. We'll be relying uh, on uh, Mr. Dix and others to make sure that we know what we're doing in terms of the acquiring of equipment. I'm also sorry to say that sometimes this equipment requires a lead time since it isn't necessarily off-the-shelf equipment. All of this to say that this particular committee is slightly different than most of the other committees that had been created in terms of their needs for them to be able to maintain control and flow of information as they have indicated they want to do. That doesn't mean we won't be writing herd on this select committee as we've done with uh, every other one to require them to justify the expenditures that they might make. It is not more than 2.5. My goal as it is with every committee budget is to come in uh, under that amount. Well, I would simply say I hope that you do provide oversight for the committee. I think this amount of money to be spent within six months I think it'll probably go down as the uh, most expensive select committee we've had, not only in actual dollars, but uh, for any select committees uh, that uh, we've had any expenditures for over the past five or six years. And I think it's uh, very, very important that you watch it, Mr. Thomas. I, uh, I understand uh, the gentleman's concern, and I uh, want and to know that, that I will uh, apply vigilance to this. However, I did want to uh, uh, underscore the statement that I made that in constant $98, the Iran-Contra amount would have been 2.9. So uh, in absolute dollars it is, but in constant $98 it is not uh, the most expensive select committee, even if they spend every dime that uh, is being uh, authorized for them. Uh, but I have full confidence in the chairman and the ranking member having known both of them in other contexts, that they will, uh, within the constraints of the dollars, spend as little as possible to accomplish the job that they think is appropriate. The comfort should be in that no matter what they want to do, it will be not more than uh, $2.5 million, which is in constant dollars, $400,000 below the Iran-Contra budget. Well, I don't, I don't know how long the... Uh... That I understand Mr. Hall's... Uh... My good friend's concerns here, and I personally believe that we can do this for less than 2.5. And we're certainly going to work with the chairman to try to accomplish that. We're not going to waste a nickel, as far as I'm concerned. Well, I don't know how long the Iran-Contra committee was actually in session. How long were they funded for? Was it a year, a year and a half? I'm not sure. I, I just respond to the gentleman. I hope this produces quality instead of quantity. I just want. I just the want answer to, to that question is 300 days. 300 days. Well, this is this is 2.5 million for six months. Yes. Okay. Well, is it all right if we move on? Thank you very much. Are there further questions of Mr. Thomas? Uh, are there further questions of the uh, two other witnesses? If not, uh, gentlemen, we uh, deeply appreciate uh, what you're about to undertake. Uh, we wish you well and. Uh, any assistance to you, don't hesitate to uh, contact us. Thank you, Mr. Thank you for coming, Appreciate both of you. Thank you. The uh, next schedule uh, witnesses are a panel. If I could call uh, Richard Allen and uh, Jim Woolsey to the table as soon as uh, um, the uh, room clears out.
close the door and uh, will everybody take their seats? <laughs> committee will come back to order. We now have uh, appearing before us uh, two of the uh, most distinguished and respected uh, members now in the private sector. Uh, they uh, both have uh, come to us uh, at some sacrifice uh, on their part. Uh, and I first would like to introduce uh, Richard Allen. Uh, he is an international business consultant in Washington and, uh, and throughout the world. He is a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution uh, and a member of the advisory board of the Center for Strategic and International Studies. He served as, an, as the assistant to the president of, uh, for national security affairs, that is the national security advisor. Um, he is a noted author and is the recipient of many uh, uh, well, meritorious awards throughout the, uh, throughout the world, which many of them I can vouch for. Uh, accompanying him is uh, Mr. James Woolsey, who was recently in uh, Israel, uh, somehow made it to, I believe, San Francisco and made it back here. Jim, I don't know how you did all that, but um, I hope you'll be, <laughs> be, in, be in condition where you, can, uh, where you can testify. I don't think I would. Uh, Mr. Woolsey is a partner in the law firm of Shea and Gardner in Washington. Uh, uh, besides serving as the director of central intelligence, uh, under President Clinton. Mr. Woolsey was, has served in the United States government as ambassador to the negotiations on conventional armed forces in Europe. Um, he uh, also was under Secretary of the Navy, General Counsel to the United States Senate Committee on Armed Services, and that list goes on and on. And he too is the recipient of many major uh, recognition awards and highly respected. Gentlemen, we appreciate you both uh, coming before us. Uh, if you. Uh, uh, take whatever time you need. You may uh, read from prepared statement. Uh, we, uh, it will be in, appear in the record without objection. Mr. Allen, I'm going to call on you first, and then our good friend, Mr. Woolsey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and members of the committee. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, I'll just race through my statement, if I may, Mr. Chairman, and I'll, I'll summarize and synopsize uh, <clears throat> where appropriate. In the summer of 1998, we've arrived at a very important juncture in U.S. national security policy, marked by this increasingly heated debate uh, about our policy toward the People's Republic of China. Many are concerned that we don't have a real policy toward China, but uh, have substituted a series of ad hoc decisions, actions, and events for a long-term strategy. This might explain the sudden decision of the President to deliver remarks last Thursday that he intended to be a comprehensive statement of policy. But it's possible to defend any policy position, and we should expect that a president would and could do just that. President Clinton's address, however, was a more political justification of his forthcoming trip than an outline of any long-term strategy. The president of the United States formulates, conducts, and is responsible for the foreign and national security policies of the United States. He has the duty to protect the security of the country and to advance our interests. He is essentially free to do as he chooses. But a wise president will elect to build a broad consensus, public and in the Congress. There's no reason why we can't have a perfectly normal relationship with China, so long as we don't deceive ourselves about the essential nature of that relationship. Moreover, no one can hope that an American president, once committed to a state visit to another country, will fail to exercise good judgment or to protect and advance American interests. It is possible, however, that an American president may predicate such a visit upon shallow expectations and false assumptions, that he may fail, fail to assert himself vigorously when it counts most, that he will lose his nerve when confronted with a determined negotiating partner, or that he will actually be snookered by a wily adversary. This is the essence of the debate in which we are about to enter. There is a widespread unease and skepticism about the capability and the intent of the administration vis-a-vis -vis China. We haven't had a complete venting of many unexplained and politically charged actions that appear to have conferred upon China important benefits and which may have severe repercussions and unintended consequences for our own long-term security and that of our allies and friends in the Pacific Basin. You meet today to consider the establishment of a select committee with a specific charge. You're not here, as Mr. Mokley observed, to uh, assess strategy or grand strategy toward China. Yet you have the very difficult task of separating the narrow issue of technology transfers that may have enhanced the capability of a potential adversary from the broader issue of our overall policy toward it. I fail to see how you can really effectively separate them in your considerations. As I see it, our national security interests have actually been damaged by acts of commission and omission related to these transfers. Those interests have also been damaged by adroit Chinese maneuvers. 
careful planning, and a strategy of evasion, denial, and grossly misleading assurances that some would call lies. Worse, I believe this administration has consistently and disregarded the realities and consequences of its actions, and now distorts the debate by polarizing those who oppose and criticize its actions. That's not necessary. How else should we consider the President's accusation that those who disagree with his outlook on China really want to isolate that country? Eight times in the China policy address last Thursday, the President used the word isolate, knowing full well that no serious person believes it possible or desirable to isolate a nation of such contemporary importance. Equally misleading is the argument that the administration is only following policies established by President Reagan and President Bush. Can anyone imagine Ronald Reagan or George Bush actually permitting the transfer of missile-related technology to China today, given what we know about the direction of China's military buildup and its continued systematic assistance to miscreants and rogues, or its continued suppression of dissidents and organized religion? But to the matter at hand, the decision to establish this select committee, Mr. Chairman, is a, a wise one. There's an urgent need for the committee. But the time for this select committee, as you've already pointed out, to initiate and complete its work is frightfully short, and the task that you're giving it is really a comprehensive task. The select committee has to carefully define the scope of its work and quickly develop a large body of information. I might add parenthetically that I would dis, uh, disagree respectfully with the suggestion by Mr. Dix that this committee or all other part permanent committees defer to this select committee alone. It's not going to be possible within the scope of time uh, for these committees to relinquish their um, major jurisdiction and their major work. Getting the information is not going to be easy, especially since we're at an era of sophisticated technique, techniques of delay, obfuscation, and outright stonewalling. And here I refer not only to the Chinese. In recent years, these skills have been refined to the status of a high science, and if the committee is going to, select committee is going to make a great deal of progress in a short period of time, probably your best course of action would be to ask uh, Jeff Gerth of the New York Times to take a leave of absence and come on board as a committee investigator. Six months for this preliminary inquiry may be sufficient, but I would urge you as members to consider now, or to begin to consider now, the recreation of this committee in the 106th Congress, because you will find that you've only scratched the surface of a very complex and uh, important topic. Much, much more congressional inquiry is going to be needed in the future. And I'm not one who particularly supports uh, permanent investigations, but this topic is important, and we're coming to a crossroads in U.S. policy toward China. Now, the relations between these two countries are extremely important, and uh, I can say only that I've watched this problem since the mid-1950s. I watched it uh, as a, a campaign assistant to President Nixon uh, in his administration twice, uh, prior to the 1980 election with President Reagan, and during the initial period of the uh, Reagan administration and since. The Reagan administration worked very hard to develop uh, relations with the People's Republic of China and fooled all the skeptics but it adamantly refused to diminish or to ignore any of its responsibilities toward Taiwan. That was a very interesting movement. But in the meantime, certain debates broke out in the early Reagan administration, and this was, uh, I think, very unfortunate in the sense that we began to pull the cork on technology transfers to China early on in the administration for what, every, what many people believed would have been the legitimate reason of confronting the Soviet Union. Many thought that China would be a strategic ally of the United States and could be made into a more or less permanent or friendly and cooperating partner as this strategy would evolve. I didn't share the strategy at the time, but um, other members of the administration did, and the President, I think, somewhat reluctantly went along. What President Nixon did uh, in 1972 in his historic initiative by opening the People's Republic of China was to offer markets to uh, this country for Chinese products and also to offer markets in China for American technology. This two-way trade has grown, grown very rapidly and has now become a permanent component of, of modern life. It's not something that we want to reverse, nor is it something that we want to hold hostage every year to a, an, an argument about most favored nation treatment. But nonetheless, the quality of this trade becomes very important in your own deliberations. Uh, perhaps we can think that it was inevitable that there would be pressures to export technology to China that might be, have a dual use or might be used in the military sector. Of course, this murky realm of dual use 
in the sense that it will assist the Chinese in improving their long-term military capabilities is something to be debated. But it has to be based on a broad consensus of American understanding and understanding by the Congress. To the extent that such collaboration actually enhances the ability of the Chinese to improve their military situation vis-a-vis -vis the United States, or to extend domination or hegemony in the Pacific Basin, this becomes a very important and vital national security interest for the United States. In my own view, the decision to use Chinese launch vehicles could be justified on an occasional basis. But even then, it carries the risk of being an unwise and a dangerous decision for the simple reason that the Chinese would naturally try to extract whatever they could for military purposes. I, too, watched the June 7th edition of 60 Minutes, and I was shocked by some of the testimony that I heard there. I'm not so sure that that storyline is complete and accurate in all its details, but what I read then was enough to make me alarmed. If sensitive, secret, and proprietary information was provided to the Chinese, if that information and technology enhances China's missile fleet accuracy, and if the sales of related machinery, machine tools, whole plant technology, computers, and supercomputers continues unabated, then there are massive gaps in our policy, to the extent that we actually have a policy at all toward China, and critical omissions in the safeguards we need when we're dealing with China. In other words, the administration would have committed a strategic mistake, one that injures our security interests. Hence the rationale for your select committee. Just imagine, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, that during the 1970s, even in the wooliest days of the detente policy toward the Soviet Union, we would exp have exported to the Soviets supercomputers, telecommunications technology and equipment, machine tools and the like. There would have been an uproar in this country. We assume today that China of the year 2000 is different from the Soviet Union of yesteryear. But if that is the case, why do the Chinese maintain missiles capable of hitting United States cities? Why are those missiles targeted on the U.S.? Are we the threat, or are we selling them the rope, so to speak, with which they'd like to hang us eventually? We simply can't overlook Chinese intentions toward the United States. What are they? We seem to get conflicting views today, which is also worth a long, hard look by Congress, regrettably a task beyond the scope of the select committee you're about to commission. But I would suggest that China builds military power today to assert its hegemony in the Western Pacific region tomorrow, to intimidate its neighbors, and eventually to displace the United States as the principal determinant and the guarantor of security in the area. In addition, China aids in the proliferation of nuclear and missile technology. The record is clear, and new evidence is pouring in every day. In my view, China is not a friendly country. China does not have any allies. It has only interests and it pursues those interests relentlessly and with persistence. I believe those interests are, in the long run, inimical to our own long-term national security interests. So the roadmap you propose to give to the select committee is definitive, comprehensive, balanced, and fair. This is not a Republican-Democrat issue, and it need not be treated as a political football. Evidence of this can be found in a head count among the president's own party and by counting their votes on substantive issues, such as human rights abuses in China. If members of Congress can't collaborate to get a speedy resolution of the serious questions raised by media revelations and by the existing facts, then this issue deserves to be taken to the public in an aggressive informational campaign. I believe you'll find out quickly that the American public does not trust China or believe its intentions to be benign. One final but crucial point. It seems to me that we all learn about the transfer of sophisticated, uh, that all we learn about the sophisticated uh, te technology that's being transferred to the People's Republic of China, combined with the recent nuclear test in the subcontinent and the restlessness of rogue states such as Iran, Libya, and North Korea, suggests the even greater urgency for an accelerated program to develop missile defense for the United States and for our allies. Delay of such a program is a conscious decision to put the American people at risk. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> well, Richard Allen, thank you very much for the, uh, for the history lesson. I, for one, needed to be reminded of all that, and uh, also for your very keen insight on, uh, on where we stand today and uh, with this terribly important issue. Uh, and now, uh, Jim Wolsey, former director of the CIA under President Clinton and uh, a very respected um, uh, man in our eyes. And we, again, we appreciate your going out of your way to be here uh, under those extenuating circumstances. Jim, you have the floor, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's an honor to be invited to appear before the committee. And I also, in light of my 
very recent arrival in town, I thank the chairman for his indulgence in letting me uh, speak extemporaneously from notes rather than submitting a uh, prepared statement. Uh, I want to address one overall issue in three parts, essentially the importance of the question that is presented to the committee, because I take it the decision to establish the select committee is driven very heavily by that. I want to speak briefly to the importance of our relations with China, to the importance of the issue of technology transfers in this context, and to the importance of the fairness and honesty of the process of governmental decision making about such issues as technology transfer to China. Addressing China for a moment, I take it that if all the facts of this case and these circumstances were as they are, except that we were concerned with France instead of China, we would probably not be sitting here today. It would be a serious matter, but not one that drove the national security. China is still a communist dictatorship. The massacre at Tiananmen Square was only the most obvious way in which it still oppresses its people. There is violence uh, every day against political dissidents in the Chinese gulag. There is violence against religious believers. There is violence against women who want to bear children. We should, however, not neglect the positive. Zhirongji's appointment and his movement toward privatization in China is a positive step, especially in so far as it moves toward the privatization of the large state-owned enterprises which dominate uh, China's urban economy. And it is po a positive fact that there has been an evolution toward uh, real elections at the local level in some parts of China. But the possibility of increased uh, uh, freedom politically and going uh, beyond economically and going beyond the bare beginnings of political liberalization doesn't mean that these positive trends will succeed in dominating China in the future. Due to the difficulty historically of centrally ruling the world's most populous nation, China has a history of decentralizing tendencies producing social and political chaos. The period of the Boxer Rebellion early in this century is one example. Those periods of chaos are frequently followed by ruthless government. Will Zhu Rongji's reforms produce, as we hope, an increasingly free economy accompanied by increasing democracy and respect for human rights, or, as may be the case, chaos and then reaction? There is no way that any of us is going to be able to tell you the answer to that. But if they begin to see chaos, the leaders in Beijing may be tempted to play the nationalism card in an effort to pull the country together. And its obvious focus will be Taiwan. Due to Taiwan's being a democracy and a free enterprise economy, it is, in a sense, an affront to the rulers in Beijing. And it is dangerous to them in the same way that a solidarity governed Poland was dangerous to the Soviet Union. Namely, it is dramatic evidence of freedom in a Chinese population and it is dramatic evidence that, contrary to some in Asia, so-called Asian values are not, as Beijing claims, autocratic. Hence, there is at least the possibility in the years to come of a confrontation between China and the United States, quite possibly uh, because of an issue in the Taiwan Straits. I would add that I believe such a confrontation would be more likely if our support for Taiwan were ambiguous rather than clear and firm. But in any confrontation, China's strategic nuclear forces will be of substantial importance. The Chinese government would see them as preventing the U.S. from coming to Taiwan's aid, or at least discouraging us from doing so. As General Zhang Guangkai put it, to the former Assistant Secretary of Defense, Chaz Freeman, during the Taiwan Straits crisis in 1996. Would the United States sacrifice Los Angeles for Taipei? He said, Los Angeles is at risk because of Chinese ICBM and nuclear capabilities. And I might add that detargeting such capabilities would be of no more value than they are with respect uh, to the detargeting by the Soviet Union, or by, by Russia, rather. Uh, this is a matter which, uh, with modern missile systems, can be changed in a matter of minutes, possibly even a matter of seconds. The second issue I want to speak to <clears throat> is the importance to national security of the issue of technology transfer in the post-Cold War context. This is vital 
a vital subject of national security with respect to China for two reasons. First of all, as I've noted, there could be some circumstances in which Chinese military capability could be quite inimical to the United interests of the United States. But there is another reason, which is that China has proven itself to be the subject of proliferation and the transfer of technology to other countries, some of it dual use, some of it nakedly military, for example, to Iran, Pakistan, and others. In the case at hand involving L'Oreal, uh, satellite launches themselves may merely be the tip of the iceberg of technology transfer if one looks at the policies of the United States government today as a whole. It is arguably the case that with appropriate safeguards, if all goes well, there would be only a small risk from providing so letting China provide solely launch services for American satellites. But all does not always go well. For example, in the L'Oreal case at hand, there may have been some disclosure of sensitive technology as a result of the accident of February 1996. It would be interesting to know, and I would hope the select committee would find out, what happened to the encryption package on the American satellite uh, after uh, the launch failed. Secondly, there could be disclosure that would be most uh, unfortunate as a result of the accident analysis. This is one of the issues that is under investigation uh, with uh, respect to L'Oreal. The reason that is important is because ICBMs and space launch vehicles are not just cousins or siblings, they are essentially clones of one another. An improvement to the guidance and performance of space launch vehicles for a nation such as China is, as night follows day, improvement of the performance uh, of their uh, ICBMs. But the technology transfer, which appropriately or, appropriately or inappropriately has occurred in this L'Oreal case, is not an isolated case of technology transfer to China. What really has taken place here, I think in part, is that American optimism after the winning of a war, just as we had a strong sense of optimism in the 1920s after winning World War I, the war to make the world safe for democracy, the war to end all wars, uh, has again asserted itself in the post-Cold War era. And in such periods as the 1920s or the 1990s, we tend to think that things are pretty rosy often and that they are unlikely uh, to uh, go sour on us. Unfortunately, uh, this may not be the case. In such periods, com commercial concerns often tend to rise to a preeminent level in decision making in American governments. It was after all in the 1920s that the President of the United States said the business of America is business. And under current circumstances, the technology transfer which has occurred over the course of the last several years with respect to China is substantial. Although satellite launch waivers, yes, reach back into the 1980s, there has been some acceleration in the last few years of technology transfer to China. Let me mention just a few. There has been licensing, legally, of sensitive missile and nuclear technology for sale to China that could assist China in developing multiple independently targeted reentry vehicles and maneuvering uh, reentry vehicles because much of the technology that has been licensed that is relevant to launching multiple satellites from a single launcher also deals with the advanced technical data and sequence such subjects as the sequencing of kick motors and other technology that would enable a multiple payload to be put um, uh, uh, to be launched from an ICBM, just as multiple payloads might be launched from a space launch vehicle. Um, related technology has been licensed. For example, an advanced technology high temperature vacuum furnace has been approved for China recently. This is the same furnace that President Bush would not allow to go to Iraq in 1990 because of its use in potentially in nuclear warhead production. Cruise missile technology involving lightweight long endurance jet engines and the global positioning system for positioning and navigation of missiles have been uh, sold uh, to China, all quite legally. There has been a transfer of some encryption technology to China. 
The Commerce Department has licensed commercial encryption technology and know-how, while at the same time providing China with nearly 50 supercomputers suitable for cracking commercial encryption codes. An American company has been given an export license to jointly develop encryption products in China, and this company provides one of the main encryption technologies for protecting the Internet uh, commercial transactions and electronic commerce, commerce and network-based banking services today. The massive decontrol of technologies since around 1993 has made it possible for China to acquire billions of dollars in advanced technology. It's key that accounting for the technology transfers is almost impossible now because by the way decontrol has been handled, there is essentially no audit trail on what has been transferred or where the systems that have sent to, been sent to China have uh, been deployed. Uh, we can't say with any certainty where the 50 or so supercomputers have ended up. Thousands of sophisticated machine tools have gone into the Chinese military industrial complex to be used for construction of ICBMs, cruise missiles, fighter aircraft, attack helicopters, and the like. And tens of millions of dollars worth of surplus machine tools and manufacturing equipment from the military uh, industry in the United States has been acquired by the Chinese at Defense Department, uh, at Defense Plant liquidation sales. So there has been a substantial increase in the last few years of the transfer of advanced militarily useful technology of this sort. There has also, I think in many ways most seriously, been a liquidation of COCOM, the international organization which we and our allies used to limit technology transfer during the Cold War. The United States government supported and in fact promoted the liquidation of COCOM in 1995, hence one uh, uh, of our major tools for even monitoring what is going on in this context has been uh, done away with. One main reason for this liquidation seems to have been interest in making it easier to export technology and goods and services to China. This has been linked to a determination to remove other obstacles in the sale of technology to China, including transferring critical exports from the Department of State to the Department uh, of Commerce, unilaterally terminating the U.S.-Japan agreement on supercomputers, which puts some uh, limits on exports of those, and significantly weakening the Defense Department's right of review in uh, licensing cases. I don't want to go on uh, further with this, Mr. Chairman, except to say that uh, this particular uh, issue is one that I think is of greatest importance for the security of the country. Bureaucratically, the defense agency, DTSA, uh, DITSA, that has been the most effective watchdog in technology transfer in the government has been uh, uh, effectively uh, cut back and banished from the Pentagon. Uh, in short, the Loral transfers are, apart from any procedural irregularities that may have occurred there, part of a substantial movement toward permitting all sorts of sensitive technology transfers preeminently to China since 1993. The third issue, and finally, that I want to make, that I want to describe, is the possibility, and at this point, it is only that, that in one or more decisions about technology transfer to China, financial contributions, either from within the United States or from abroad, have influenced the decision. Now, up until this point, in spite of concerns about China and in spite of concerns about technology transfer, I would say that what we have is simply a serious policy matter. And furthermore, it is a policy matter on which reasonable people can differ over the proper mix of accommodation to China on the one hand and firmness on the other, or engagement versus containment, if you prefer. I incline at the present time, particularly due to the uncertainty about China's future, more toward the containment uh, end of the spectrum. But I very much respect the views of others, some of them good friends of mine, such as Brent Scowcroft, Henry Kissinger, and Bill Perry, who on one issue or another are a bit further toward the engagement end of the spectrum. But apart from the merits 
of any individual decision. The possibility that any decisions about this important issue may have been made on the basis of financial contributions makes this question of transfers to China of an extremely serious matter. I'm indebted to the magazine The Weekly Standard for pointing out that this concern, possible foreign corruption of our political process, was addressed in the Federalist Papers. As a result of the quotation from the Standard, I looked up the original. Hamilton, writing in the Federalist number 68, 210 years ago this spring, was describing the electoral system positively in the Constitution for the President of the United States. And speaking of the work of the Convention in Philadelphia, he said the following. Nothing is more to be desired than that every practical obstacle should be opposed to cabal, intrigue, and corruption. These most deadly adversaries of Republican government might naturally have been expected to make their approaches from more than one quarter, but chiefly from the desire in foreign powers to gain an improper ascendant in our councils. Mr. Chairman, I believe that as was true at the time of the birth of the Republic, it is the case today. In the last analysis, if we cannot be sure that the most sensitive decisions regarding the fundamentals of how we are to deal with a potential major strategic challenge such as China are being made objectively and uncorrupted by money, then we would have to doubt the most fundamental competence and honesty of our government. In short, I can think of no subject that more clearly would require a careful and thorough investigation by a select committee of the Congress, and I could think of few that would even be in the same league. It would, frankly, pain me greatly as a citizen if the committee is led to the conclusion that any of these decisions have been rooted in corruption, foreign or domestic. But we stand with only a very few other countries in the world in being able to conduct such an important self-examination fairly and objectively. This is as important a job as has been given to a congressional committee in recent years. I would only conclude by saying let the chips fall where they may. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> well, uh, former CIA Director uh, Jim Woolsey, let me... Uh, let me just say that uh, in my 31 years in elective office, uh, I don't think I've ever heard a more thorough, more insightful, and uh, uh, extemporaneous uh, remarks uh, uh, given before just from a, from a yellow pad. Uh, the only rival to that would be when Richard Nixon, uh, several years before his death, appeared before the Republican caucus and spoke for an hour. Uh, and uh, he was almost as good as you today. Yeah, no notes, I think. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and likewise to, uh, to my very good friend Richard Allen, and we, we certainly appreciate uh, men of your credibility coming before us and your integrity. And uh, uh, let me uh, pose, uh, I have a series of questions which I, which I would like to submit to you in writing, and perhaps you could uh, get back to us so that we don't take up all of your time today. But uh, just one question to Dick Allen and then one to, uh, to you, Jim. Uh, the, to Mr. Allen, uh, and you know, I, I uh, uh, personally uh, was critical of, uh, of the uh, technology transfer uh, policies of both President Reagan and President Bush. Uh, so I, uh, I don't hesitate, hesitate to ask this question, which may sound partisan, but it is not. Uh, the Clinton administration has claimed that it is merely continuing the export policies toward China of its predecessors. And my question is, to, do you agree? And if not, how, in your view, does the administration policy differ from that of President Reagan and Bush? I know you alluded to it in your statement, but could you want, once more, for the record, tell us what those differences are? And then, Jim, if I might, uh, I might just ask you the follow-up question. How significant, in your view, was the Clinton administration's 1996 decision to transfer control of satellite exports to the Commerce Department? And I would like your... Uh, your, uh, certainly your professional expertise on that. And Dick, if you can go first and then Jeff. Well, I think it's an indisputable fact that uh, there is a thread that traces back to President Reagan's or original decision, President Bush's three decisions, and of course carrying through the 10 decisions that have been made by the Clinton administration. That's, that's history. 
And uh, these are facts that are not to be disputed. But it's the context that counts, Mr. Chairman, here. It's, it's not just uh, elaboration and continuation of a policy. A policy is not something that, once enacted, never is changed according to circumstances uh, and changing times. And I think, uh, having been present at the creation when President Nixon decided to uh, establish a breakthrough, even before that in his, his political campaign, and knowing something of his own thinking about this, and in President Reagan's thinking as well, it seems to me patently obvious that they, and perhaps even President Bush, would have paused at some point to assess the cumulative impact of a policy that involves such massive, and that's what it is, massive transfer of technology over a long period of time. You have to stop and take a deep breath and say, is this the right thing to do? The fact that we went down that road in the beginning does not justify or provide any intellectual, political, or, or, or even a commercial, or maybe it does commercial grounds, uh, for the continuation of such a policy. When a policy doesn't work any longer, you reevaluate it and you adjust it according to those new circumstances. If you believe, as I certainly do, that China is a potential adversary, and I associate myself with the point of view that believes that containing China is, is a better strategy than not, then you'll also believe that any enhancement of China's ability to project power and to influence decision-making and security decision-making in particular in the region uh, is adverse to American long-range interests. The other day, Mr. Chairman, the President said, and I quote, some Americans believe we should try to isolate and contain China because of its undemocratic system and human rights violations and in order to retard its capacity to become America's next great enemy. Well, that's a pretty sensible statement as far as I'm concerned, I, although I don't agree with the isolation part. And I think that's, again, drawing the strategy of unfair alternatives. It's either this horrible uh, uh, alternative or my policy. That's not the way the world works. The point is that we deal with China as it is. And as I mentioned, we can have a normal commercial relationship that even involves the sale of some advanced technologies, because that may be in our interest. I don't believe that trade with China automatically will bring democracy. This is a favorite commercial argument. We heard it during the, the days of the detente policy in the 1970s. Uh, with the argument that we would change the Soviet Union, for example. Well, it didn't take that strategy. That strategy was a failed strategy. And I would remind you that Ronald Reagan ran as much against the de failed detente policy of the 1970s of Presidents Nixon, Ford, and therewith that of Secretary Kissinger, as he did against Jimmy Carter uh, and his policy of whatever that was, engagement, or I'm not sure what the policy was, was right. at the time. And he was right. And uh, so. Just to put a cap on this, uh, there are qualitative differences. There, there are historical differences as well. And we must take all of that into account when we look at this broad issue of the transfer of technology to China and its contribution to China's ultimate strength. We don't want to confront ourselves on a battlefield uh, some years hence over a particularly sensitive issue, particularly that related to Taiwan, which Jim Woolsey mentioned, and I associate myself fully with his remarks. Well, thank you very much. And uh, uh, Jim, I don't know whether you want to expand on that or the question that I ask you, I'll, either I'll, or both. I'll go ahead and address the one that you yeah. uh, asked, Mr. Chairman, of me. Um, I believe that the decision in 1996 was, was, first of all, made at a most unfortunate time. It was announced right in the middle of the uh, Taiwan uh, Straits uh, uh, missile crisis. And um, on balance, I would disagree with it, but I don't think it was an irresponsible decision. I think it would be possible to use Commerce Department licensing to monitor adequately American satellites for launch by uh, Chinese uh, uh, launch vehicles. But the general tone and tenor of the Commerce Department in these matters is essentially to promote exports. And staying, keeping satellites on the State Department list, on the munitions list, would have been a decision for much greater care and precision. I serve as a, an ombudsman approved by the Department of State for the employees of a company 
that uh, at an earlier time uh, uh, violated export control uh, laws uh, by exporting something that was on the munitions list uh, in, improperly. I'm the individual that I have an 800 number they're supposed to call if anything uh, 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 is done improperly and I file a report with the State Department twice a year about this company. Uh, I know how much more difficult and how uh, careful companies are now with respect to anything on the ITAR and on the munitions list, whereas uh, with respect to the commerce list, there is an understanding that one has to go through certain procedures. But I can see how the corporate culture of a company would lead an engineer or someone else to focus first and foremost on the uh, a cooperative effort to uh, solve a technical problem with uh, a Chinese company on a launch, uh, as long as the U.S. government was dealing with that uh, partnership, essentially, of satellite and launch vehicle, American and Chinese, uh, in a business context, in a Commerce Department context. Uh, so it's possible to use the Commerce List more rigorously than it has been used in these cases. But as a general proposition, it tends to incline uh, the system toward exports and uh, away from uh, precision and care. And I think if it were not the case that China were exporting ballistic missile technology to uh, uh, rogue states, if it were not the case that ICBMs are virtually identical with space launch vehicles, uh, I, I think uh, uh, an approval of, uh, of satellite launches on, uh, on uh, Chinese vehicles would probably be a relatively straightforward and routine matter. But those, uh, those two facts in the current circumstances would incline me to believe that they uh, should have, uh, uh, the satellite should have stayed uh, on the munitions list. But again, as I said, I, I don't believe this was an irresponsible decision by the government. Jim, thank you very much. Um, as I said before, I have a series of questions, but rather than take uh, up your time and that of the committee right now, we would ask you to perhaps give us uh, your answers later on. Sure. Mr. Moakley, did you? No, I just want to thank the gentlemen for their expertise. It's mm -hmm. nice to hear from them once again. Okay. Thank you. The uh, Chairman of the Intelligence Committee, Mr. Goss. Thank you very much. I have lots of questions, but I'm afraid this is the wrong forum for the, <laughs> the, the, the gentleman in front of me. So I. I'll pass and uh, try and figure out a way that we can get some information back uh, as, as appropriate as we go along. I would like to take advantage of your presence and ask a couple of questions, though, um, on things that I think are very important in this and why we have a select committee and how we're going about our work, which is what the Rules Committee's charge is here today. And the, the question I have here has to do with a cooperation question. Um, I, the, question has been properly asked today, what is the cost going to be of this subcommittee, of this select committee, and how long is it going to take to do its work? So I think the answer really depends on what kind of cooperation we get. And I would like to go back to your observations uh, in your service of government of cooperation uh, in this type of investigation. It is my view we've had assurances from the administration that they will cooperate with us. Uh, equally, we have not gotten the materials from the administration. Uh, that they said that they would provide until very recently, and even then I don't know if, if uh, that is the end of the cooperation or whether or not they'll actually help us get these witnesses and so forth, which is, I think, one of the reasons why we are doing what we're doing. I would be curious to know, uh, from your perspective, um, having served in past administrations, whether it is reasonable to expect in our oversight capacity on a matter of national security like this the kind of cooperation that we're anticipating getting. Two examples that come immediately to mind, Mr. Goss. Um, one goes all the way back to the early days of 1969 in the Nixon administration when Senator Symington set up a subcommittee on commitments. Um, it was then thought not to be very consequential, American commitments abroad. Um, it was not thought to be very consequential, but Secretary Laird made a decision, uh, perhaps a fateful decision, uh, that gave access to two subcommittee investigators to go to the Pentagon and to root through uh, the files. This was a new administration and uh, had just come to office and hadn't created many of the commitments, indeed most of the commitments uh, that existed at the time. 
but there was a systematic leakage. If you're looking for the origins of modern leakage, I can uh, hold forth on this as long as you'd like, but uh, I won't do that today. Um, there was systematic leakage. One of these persons writes for a major newspaper here in town, uh, and we read him regularly, um, and uh, he was very effective. And uh, this ultimately led, these leaks led President Nixon to be quite literally ballistic uh, about such leaks, and uh, I can tell you that I, I'm just now writing about this, um, uh, this historical period. Um, he uh, uh, found that the straw that broke his back was the release of the Pentagon Papers. And we tend to think that the Pentagon Papers were documents from his administration. They weren't. They were documents from another administration, the Johnson administration, as a matter of fact. Um, the Pentagon Papers uh, became then the subject of a real political football, and things went ballistic. But the point is that at that early stage, before we invented the term stonewalling in the modern context, at that early stage, there was cooperation with a Senate committee. In fact, it was extensive and months, one might even say, uh, too much cooperation because the Nixon administration wound up being blamed for commitments that it didn't put in place in the first place. The second instance that comes to mind is that of uh, the Iran-Contra Iran itself. When the Reagan administration announced immediately that it would subject itself to an inquisition and investigation, and the Tower Commission was set up. And there was a great deal, as I recall, a great deal of interaction between the Tower Commission and members of Congress uh, at that time. So there is a precedent. Today, if we have politicized, if we're, or if we're going to politicize every single issue, including vital national security and foreign policy issues, obfuscate, stonewall, and withhold information on such issues in the same fashion that we witness on domestic issues that are very hot and explosive. And if we become so polarized in this discussion that there's not going to be cooperation, then I believe the public will exact retribution. I believe that uh, this puts the United States at great risk. Of course, there's been politicization before, but I expect that this would be one of the most dangerous cases of modern times and with profound consequences. Congressman Goss, I'll just say that, uh, first of all, I believe that uh, although this is a difficult and doubtless contentious and extremely important matter, I do believe that the quality of the prospective chairman and ranking member and the tone and attitude with which they were approaching the deliberations today, and knowing both of them, the tone with which I'm certain they will approach the investigation as a whole, will go a long way toward uh, helping create a climate uh, for executive branch uh, cooperation. Uh, secondly, this is a matter of uh, very substantial national importance by any measure. It, uh, not to put too fine a point on it, is not a matter related to an individual's personal behavior or otherwise. It is a matter of security and goes, as the Federalist uh, quote uh, indicates, uh, right to the heart of the uh, legitimate functioning of the uh, U.S. government. So uh, I believe and hope that uh, the Congress and this committee will find a substantial, uh, uh, hopefully total, uh, cooperation uh, by the executive branch. Uh, but um, uh, I have uh, been a general counsel of a committee of the other body for three years. I've conducted uh, investigations myself. I know they can take uh, strange turns, and uh, I won't make any uh, specific predictions. I would just uh, 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 enunciate that hope. May I just add one point, uh, uh, Mr. Goss, that I think you're going to find that this amount of money that uh, Mr. Hall pointed out was a substantial amount of money in a short period of time is only the tip of the iceberg, too, of what you're going to wind up spending on a broader inquiry in the next Congress and perhaps the one beyond that on these issues. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, we should probably move to Mr. Frost. Um, I would, uh, and I don't know if, the, uh, if our witnesses have the resolution in front of them. They may not have it. Uh, if they can, if someone can give them a copy, I, I, might, I just want to ask them about uh, one portion of the resolution. 
I have an earlier version, uh, Mr. Frost. I well, that's probably the one I have, too. Things change rapidly here. This, this one has a June 9th date on it, June 9th, 1998. Uh, uh, I have no date, so... Uh, but well, it's on the first page. Yes, first sir. First page, right under work, where it says Resu... In the no, House of Representatives, June 9, June 9, yeah. Okay, you read the right one. Um, the, uh, the resolution in its uh, jurisdiction section, uh, section 2, uh, sets out a number of, uh, of items. And the first three of these under subsection A... What, it starts on page two, page two of the resolution, yes. where it says section two, jurisdiction. The, the first three of these items, number one, number two, and number three, really go to the larger issue of whether we ought to be transferring this technology. And then it is the subsequent sections of the jurisdiction statement that go to the issue of whether they were political contributions, uh, either foreign or domestic, that had an impact on this. Um, and, and really, my question is, if, at the, if, if after the committee has completed its work and it, for sake of argument, it doesn't find any improper political contributions, either foreign or domestic, and I don't know what they're going to find, whether they'll find that or not, but if, and, and, and when this is all over, they don't find any improper political contributions that, that in any way influenced uh, administration policy, I gather both of you feel that the entire issue as set out in number one, two, and three on the question of whether it's appropriate for us to transfer this technology is, is, is very important for this uh, select committee. And that even if the select committee should find nothing improper happened, that we should spend a great deal of our time focusing on the first three questions on whether this technology should have been transferred and should continue to be transferred by our government to China. Congressman Frost, I guess what I would say to that is I think if there, if it turns out quite clearly there have been uh, no, uh, there's been no corruption in any sense of that word uh, uh, from foreign or domestic sources, uh, what we have embodied in the first uh, uh, three uh, paragraphs is one of the most important public policy questions and governmental policy questions uh, facing the United States government. Uh, and uh, one that it seems to me Congress, through some mechanism, uh, uh, should uh, uh, illuminate and educate uh, 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 the uh, population on. Uh, but I don't know whether or not, in that hypothetical, the select committee would be the device that the, the, this committee or the, the House of Representatives would use for that purpose. I, I, think, uh, uh, I think this is an extremely important uh, uh, issue, and I expressed uh, my, uh, my views on it. But without uh, any uh, uh, element of corruption, it is just that. And I would say it is a matter about which reasonable people can and do differ. I'm on one side of that argument, more or less, and, but, it, but uh, it's, uh, it still is a policy issue to me. <clears throat> Um, I would certainly uh, agree with that, and I think that the Congress is going to want to look at these issues in the long term. It's been nearly 40 years, Mr. Frost, since the Congress has had the searching inquiry that was conducted by the eminent Scoop Jackson, Senator Jackson, Henry Jackson of Washington, under the rubric of organizing for national security. He conducted uh, hearings over three or four, three years, I believe, uh, in which he in, to which he invited uh, or subpoenaed or whatever uh, uh, requisitioned leading experts in this country and from abroad to testify on an entire range of issues about how to organize for national security. It seems to me that this then would be a vital component of a larger issue, although the Congress, 40 years later, does not have the luxury of time that Mr. Jackson had at that time. Uh, his contribution was signal. It had a lasting impact on the organization of the national security apparatus and its actual conduct. And um, you know, to the extent that Congress can only make little spurts uh, of uh, mm -hmm. contributions to a similar activity today as we approach the millennium, I think that's extremely important, especially in an era of terrorism and uh, the possibility of uh, weapons of mass destruction being transported in very small containers across national mm -hmm. lines. Well, I, as a member of Congress over the years, have found this to be a perplexing issue as to whether we should, in fact, uh, transfer any of this technology. And I think most of my colleagues have found this to be a difficult issue to deal with. And my question really goes, and I guess uh, Mr. Goss is here, and perhaps we could uh, engage in a little, a little discussion about this. Uh, 
the, the question is if you, the, if when all said and done and you get to the point of a finding of no corruption, does this com set select committee then go forward with the first three paragraphs or does it stop and say we need the Intelligence Committee to do this, we need the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee to do this, we need the Armed Services Committee. At what point does this select committee continue on if it in fact finds, gets to a finding of no corruption? If the gentleman will yield, um, uh, I'd be happy to respond. I think that the scope of the uh, select committee is fairly broad. And uh, I, I think that there are a number of points that they are going to be pursuing there. But I think that uh, our witnesses have focused on I think Mr. Allen focused on it very well when he said he disagreed with Mr. Dix that the other major committees were going, should give up their right, that's portfolio. That's the point I'm raising. I, I, I can absolutely assure you the Intelligence Committee is not going to give up its portfolio on the question of undue or inappropriate or illegal activity in elections to influence our elections by foreign authorities or whatever. Yeah, that, that's not really the question I'm asking, though, but it's assuming that there is no finding of illegality, to go back to the, the basic point of whether we ought to be transferring technology at all and whether this select committee the, is the appropriate vehicle for then pursuing that question or whether it would be turned over to other committees of the House. I think that would be a recommendation of the select committee as to what to do what, with whatever it is they find and by way of truth. But I can assure you that the question of uh, turning over transfer uh, of technology or the transfer of the turning over, the yeah. re-export or so forth, you could end up in, in many tiers of problem here. You could have technical violations. You could have blatant willful violations yeah. that affect national security. You can have quite a range of consequences. Well, I understand all that. And my suggestion is that the future is going to depend on what the truth is. Yeah, but, but, my, but my question is assuming and you assume for sake of argument that there is no finding of illegality, but there is still a major policy dispute and question as to whether we ought to be doing this in the first place, which is what Mr. Solomon has been concerned about over the years, uh, about whether we ought to be uh, transferring any of this technology uh, if the, to uh, China. If the and that's my question yield, is who should handle that. <clears throat> let me get my two cents worth in here because uh, uh, let me tell you one of the reasons that I support the establishment of this select committee is not only to find out if there has been corruption, both uh, either domestic or otherwise, uh, but also to refocus this Congress, which has been unfocused now for ever since the fall of the Soviet empire. Uh, everybody assumes there's no enemy out there anymore. And yet uh, here we find out we've got a major country in this world, a world power, uh, with 13 um, intercontinental missiles yeah. uh, aimed at the United States of America. Well, I, so let me just say yeah. that uh, when this committee, uh, this subcommittee or this select committee disbands, I hope will, it will have accomplished not only its original intent to find out if there has been corruption, but also to uh, then refocus these eight committees and this Congress on the transfer of technology, the effect of any transfer, and certainly the conduct of defense contractors and how this information is leaked out. We better stop abolishing COCOMs around here. We better realize that we are the world leader. Nobody is going to look out for us. We better be able to look out for ourselves. So I hope that answers your question. Well, yeah, my, my, we want to get back focused on this issue. Yeah, my, my question is the duration and the scope of this select committee, uh, Mr. Chairman, and that's why I raise this issue, exactly. because we may get to a point six months from year now or a year from now in which this committee has to its best of its, uh, its ability, uh, reached conclusions about whether there was illegal conduct or not. Or, and once they've gotten beyond that, then what happens to the broader issue of whether we ought to be doing That's this, right. whether it, even if it's legal under current law, whether we ought to be doing this, and that really, that's why I'm trying to get at some sense of whether this is this select committee is going to be in existence for five years, and whether they're going to be coming back in for a lot more money at somewhere down the road, because if they really are going to explore what you would like them to explore, that is a very complicated question, and that will revolve a great deal, involve a great deal of resources. Just, I would just say to the gentleman that I would hope that. Uh, this committee would not go on for one, two, or three years, that it would uh, terminate itself at the end of, uh, of this year. But having said that, I would hope that it would refocus this Congress. It might even lead to another select committee uh, that might look into these legal policies that may be affecting the future of this country. Mr. Goss. Would gentlemen continue to yield? Yes, sir. I, I'm a little puzzled because I read Beyond 7 in the version I'm reading, and we may be reading from different versions. Yeah. Uh, I get to 8, 9, and 10, and just for instance, 
decision making within the executive branch. Oh, I've, I've saw those two. Sure. Okay. So my, here, here is the subject: decision making within the executive branch, of the United States government, with respect to any of the foregoing matters. That's national security. Right. That is a huge subject because that's the subject of oversight. If I ask uh, Mr. Woolsey how many times he talked to the President of the United States uh, in his position when he was active as the Director of Central Intelligence, uh, I would be, I don't know if he could answer the question or not, but if you heard the answer, you'd probably be horrified. I was. And it's, it reflects to me that there's something seriously wrong with the decision-making process uh, in the United States government. Mr. Wills, you want to bite on that? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Congressman Goss, when I was Director of Central Intelligence for two years, I, of course, attended all the National Security Council meetings, and there were a number of them, and met with the President then. Early in the uh, administration, uh, the President had the morning uh, CIA briefer uh, in with, with uh, some degree of frequency, but that tended uh, not to be the case as time went on, and uh, I, I would, early in the administration, sit in on uh, those briefings when I could. Uh, as far as other sort of one-on-one -on -one or two-on-two -two meetings, uh, in fact, there were two in two years, um, and uh, uh, when uh, uh, that little airplane uh, crashed uh, into uh, the White House in September of 94. Uh, I was told that the White House staff joke was, uh, that must be Woolsey still trying to get an appointment. Uh, <laughs> so I would say my, uh, my uh, record was, uh, was uh, mixed uh, in... Uh well, the, uh, the, the title of the resolution, of course, uh, is fairly broad. Uh, well, the title I have is... It, it, basically goes to uh, the People's Republic of China, national security and military commercial sales. As I said, that's pretty broad. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it seems like it's getting broader. I, I, no, I, I mean, I'm, I'm reading the words of the resolution, and the words of the resolution provide a very broad mandate uh, for this committee. We may decide that's a good idea. We may decide that we really, that this is the vehicle, This these nine members may be uh, uh, may, may find that they're going to be spending a great deal of time on a very important issue to this country after you get beyond the question of le legal or illegal. I agree numbers. with the gentleman's yeah. point. Gentlemen, but, uh, yeah. gentlemen, we're going to have to uh, just wrap I, this up. In, uh, I think that I, I, I was getting that through Mr. Allen's testimony that this is only the beginning, yeah. that maybe a continuing committee like this should be in existence just to keep their eyes focused on us. Is this what I was getting from you, Mr. Allen? Yes, sir. Um, my favorite would be to model it on the permanent investigating subcommittee of the Senate, which Senator Jackson headed, and he converted that committee to, uh, to this purpose, <laughs> for a broad inquiry into national security, which served uh, presidents of both parties and members of both parties and served the nation honorably and well. Thank you. And that decision will be made uh, sometime later, yes, not sir. today. Yes, sir. Uh, is there, are there further questions? Uh, my good friend, Mr. McGinnis from Colorado. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for our witnesses. Uh, Mr. Wolseley and Mr. Allen, constituent of my district. It was snowing there yesterday. Probably you could see it from your home there in Vail. But uh, uh, at any rate, uh, I heard what Mr. Frost's comments are, and I take kind of a different angle of this. I think that the emphasis of this committee on a short term should be more specifically directed towards paragraph four, which talks about the conduct of the executive branch. That's page three. Uh, again, section four, the conduct of the executive branch of the United States government with respect to the transfers or enhancements. And specifically, uh, my interest in having the committee address that on March 14th, uh, 1996, the president decided to transfer ultimate control of satellite exports from the State Department to the Commerce Department, which is as we all know, bureaucratically more disposed to favoring looser export restrictions in order to aid U.S. business. It's also worth noting, I think, that the Secretary of State or the then Secretary of State, Warren Christopher, opposed this type of policy change. That needs to be addressed versus the long or broader picture that my good friend Mr. Frost addresses. I think paragraph number five, the conduct of the defense contractors and the weapons manufacturers. I mean, I, 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 and I'd be interested in your comments, uh, one, about uh, waivers overruling the State Department if that happened during your tenure, two, very, very brief responses, and then two, what's your perception of when, when you served in your various administrations, the, how was the deal with these defense contractors, whether they feel their ethical uh, or, or their highest ethical values to their stockholders or to their country? Paragraph seven, 
uh, any effort by the government of the People's Republic of China to uh, influence. And paragraph number eight is Mr. Goss uh, said de decision making within the executive branch. What are the safeguards? What are the checks and balances within there so we don't transfer this technology? But that aside, let me go back to the, the first two points. I'd be interested in your comments as to during the administration if a president specifically overruled the State Department recommendation with transfer of, of tech, uh, uh, classified material like this, number one. And number two, uh, is an administration, were you under constant pressure during your respective tenure by defense contractors to constantly loosen restrictions on uh, classified material? If you could just respond to those terms. If I could just interrupt for a moment, uh, uh, Scott McGinnis, I'll just say that uh, uh, these witnesses have been here for a long time, and they have covered those uh, seven paragraphs at length. And if they could just address your, your last question, right. I would appreciate it, because uh, it would be redundant since you've already given testimony. But Mr. Allen. Uh, briefly, Mr. McGinnis, and th uh, thank you for the comments about the snow yesterday in Colorado. Um, the, uh, the pressures were pressures to a certain extent that we invited in the early days of the Reagan administration, because we had to get well quickly. Our defenses had deteriorated to such a state um, that we needed to accelerate defense spending rapidly and deploy many and new systems, which we did in relatively short order. Um, I can't comment since that time because I haven't been in office, but my feeling and my observation is that indeed these pressures become overwhelming today. And if we, going back to what I had said in my statement, if we really believe that China is a friendly country, just like any other, and with which we can get along and with uh, in the pursuit of whose conversion sale of these technologies uh, would somehow help accelerate the process of conversion to democracy and respect for human rights and the like uh, then all of it makes sense otherwise it doesn't Very good. thank you thank you Scott <laughs> are there further questions Ms. Slaughter uh, gentlemen, I'm sure that you realize by the time they get down to me, everything worthy of having been said has been said, and I'm only to hurry up. So you need not comment on what I have to say. I simply just want to make an observation. First, it's been a really joy listening to the two of you. It's been a wonderful history lesson. But second, um, the tragedy to me is if we find out we made an awful mistake in 1988, there's going to be very little we can do about it. And in that regard, I must express my concern personally for the fact that the intelligence agencies, I think, have let us down dreadfully. Uh, if I am correct, and I understand I don't know all the facts, uh, the intelligence agencies we're counting on did not tell us about the bomb test, for example, in India and Pakistan, or that the communism was falling. And therefore, uh, I, I think rather than, than throw all the blame on the administration, as we seem to be doing here today, no matter whose administration it was, uh, that we might have considered the notion that from time to time they might have been badly advised. You don't want to come. I, I, I would. You, you I, may. I would, I'd be happy to I'd hear be, from you. I, I will in just a minute. I'd be glad to take that go one ahead, on if I Wilson. might, Mr. Chairman. Uh, intelligence uh, agencies are, uh, are far uh, uh, from perfect. Uh, but as a general proposition, uh, uh, Congressman Slaughter, I think the um, uh, issue that you alluded to only very briefly about uh, uh, not uh, seeing uh, the uh, fall of communism has been substantially uh, overdrawn. I uh, hold no brief for the U.S. intelligence community until, except for the period uh, February of 93 to uh, January of 95, mm -hmm. but I've served in the executive branch uh, in uh, every administration since the Johnson administration, uh, uh, except uh, during the Ford administration. And uh, for much of the time I have been in law practice, I've been on various advisory boards and commissions and reading intelligence reports. So I've followed intelligence reporting, particularly on the Soviet Union, fairly thoroughly since the late 1960s. And I would say uh, the following. Uh, U.S. intelligence did an excellent job of assessing Soviet military uh, uh, hardware plans and programs and doctrine, and much of its focus was, uh, was on that because that was what was most dangerous. It did a good job. I think I'd give it kind of a B plus to A minus on stresses uh, within the Soviet system, uh, Soviet politics, criminology, and the like. It did a fair job on most aspects of the Soviet economy, but a terrible job on assessing the gross national product 
of the Soviet Union, and that particular number, Senator Moynihan and others have, have stressed, was, uh, was really way off, and they just blew that one, no doubt about it. Um, but institutionally, if I look at uh, think tanks, the academic world, uh, uh, academics who were assessing what was going on in the Soviet Union, public figures of all sorts, I would say that the uh, U.S. intelligence community on the Soviet uh, uh, issue over the years was better than any other institution I know of, although it fell far behind uh, in making a, uh, uh, an accurate assessment of what was to happen. Um, of uh, two individuals who rather famously at the end of the 70s and beginning of the 80s uh, said that uh, essentially within a decade uh, uh, the Soviet Union is going to collapse and those were Ronald uh, Reagan and Daniel Patrick Moynihan. And I guess what I think about that is that maybe the Irish just hear voices that the rest of us don't hear. I, uh, I, uh, um, on, uh, on India and Pakistan, <laughs> right. on India, uh, the, pretty much everybody missed the BJP's uh, move toward nuclear testing, uh, except The Economist magazine. It wasn't just the CIA that was fooled, it was the rest of the U.S. government, it was the State Department, it was China, uh, it was uh, uh, pretty much everyone. And what happened was that they ignored what the BJP had said in its policy documents, and they listened to what it said after it became the leader of the coalition. And just as Mein Kampf was the best thing to read to understand what Hitler was going to do from the 20s on, so the best thing to understand what the BJP was going to do was to just read their policy statements to their own followers. Uh, the other, and, and that was a failure of the intelligence community because although they weren't alone, uh, we should hold them to a higher standard than anyone else in putting themselves into the shoes of someone like the leadership of the BJP. Did um, you say we didn't learn anything from not reading Mein Kampf? I think uh, uh, a lot of intelligence agencies around the world, and the CIA is no exception, uh, uh, don't do a nearly good enough job of immersing themselves in the cultural outlook of their intelligence target. They instead tend to, as the phrase, to mirror image to look at things through American eyes, uh, and, and that's a mistake. The, the Indians tweaked up their test range uh, by digging uh, the holes and laying the cables to be necessary for nuclear testing, and they did that a year or so ago, and uh, they really uh, were able to test with only a day or so worth of warning. If the U.S. intelligence community had been watching intently, it might have gotten a few hours worth of warning, but I don't think that would have been enough to have, uh, have uh, 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 let the president uh, uh, effectively uh, move to uh, stop the tests. And I don't really think they were off on the Pakistani tests. I think those they, they had pretty well. Is there anything we could, uh, let's say we, you know, we have this select committee does come up with, uh, th we've made terrible mistakes here. What? Is that genie out of the bottle? Is there anything that we can do to on uh, on nuclear on, on on India and Pakistan? No, on China. Rick, you well, uh, uh, on India and Pakistan, or on anyone China. on China. China. Yeah, you can simply stop doing what we're doing now. That's that would be the first uh, <laughs> first well, step. Just, just give well, me your assessment, though, on how much damage. I, obviously, you feel we have made mistakes. Well, it's yeah, the damage. The, uh, I won't go on with, but the damage is is long term in the sense that we enhance the capabilities of the other side to more accurately to target us mm -hmm. and to threaten the region. That's the problem, and that's the damage. It's not assessable uh, in, in right. very immediate terms of slaughter. Well, that's, that's the tragedy here for me, though. It seems that that was apparent to so many people. Why did the government fail to understand it? <coughs> well, you, uh, was, as, uh, as I, I guess coming back again, was there bad advice here? I don't know if it's bad advice, but there were, there were pressures and there, was a general, there has been a general belief that China is a nation like every other, mm -hmm. and that it's rapidly progressing toward a democracy and is in the process of rapid change, and that whatever we do in this context might accelerate it while serving our own interests. That's a point of view with which I profoundly disagree, and I, I think members of the select committee oh. will find that they disagree. Congressman Slaughter, let me just add one point. Um, I think the intelligence community's assessments of China over the years I've been familiar with them have been quite good. 
Um, and I don't think, I, I never thought of myself as DCI as offering advice to the president. Indeed, I was explicitly asked not to offer political advice. I was there to assess intelligence and see and, and do the best we could to describe what was happening or might be likely uh, well, I to happen in the world. I'm not asking about political advice. Oh, I understand, but even advice on policy. Uh, uh, generally speaking, I think it's best for DCIs to stay out of that, and I, I certainly did, and that's the way the president uh, wanted it. So I, th but I think with respect to intelligence assessments of China's conduct and China's uh, export of uh, technology to other countries, uh, dual-use technology and uh, and uh, ballistic missile and nuclear technology and the like, uh, China's uh, conduct with respect to Taiwan, I honestly believe uh, U.S. intelligence has done a very good job on that over the course of the last few years. Thank you very much, <coughs> gentlemen. Uh, in, in just closing out, let me also. Uh, say that um, I want to be um, a defender of our intelligence community, uh, uh, having spent 20 years spending a great deal of time, uh, both when I was on the Foreign Affairs Committee and now on this committee, in uh, receiving briefings from all the intelligence community. Uh, I think they do an outstanding job. Sometimes I think the Congress interferes with their doing their job, both in a lack of funding and sometimes with micromanaging, but nevertheless, they do an excellent job. And uh, uh, as far as uh, the intelligence community looking at it, uh, Jim, in the, in the eyes of uh, perhaps other than Americans. Um, they are intelligence gathering uh, organizations and uh, they should be gathering that information, giving it to us, and, and we then sometime ought to be looking at it in the, uh, perhaps in the eyes of others as well. So I just want to uh, commend both of you for your, uh, your outstanding uh, statements. It's been a, uh, very, very helpful to me and I, and I think to all of the uh, members, including uh, Mr. Moakley and, and certainly Mr. Goss. We want to thank you and again, we might want to call on your expertise in the uh, next several days or so just to uh, complete our record. But again, we salute both of you. Mr. Chairman, and I would yield I, to Mr. Allen. Yes. I just want to say that while we're in the process of commending people, I've had the pleasure of working with you for many, many years. And this may be the last opportunity that I have to appear before you directly. It won't be the last opportunity I have to see you. But I'd like to commend you for many, many years of dedicated service to your nation, not only from the military point of view and the national security point of view, but all you've done over your years in Congress uh, to, and unless we can change your mind, I have to say up until 1998, uh, thank you very much. You've been a great patriot and it's been a pleasure to have had the opportunity to work with you on more than one occasion. Here, here. Well, Richard, you could change my mind tomorrow, but you couldn't change my wife's. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very, very much for coming. We appreciate it. And uh, now I'm going to apologize for three other witnesses. And if I could call them to the table as a panel, it would be Dr. Paul Friedenberg, international trade consultant with Baker and Botts, uh, and uh, then Joel L. Johnson, Vice President of Aerospace Industries Association of America Incorporated, and John Pike, Director of the Space Policy Project, Federation of American Scientists. Um, and gentlemen, uh, again, let me extend our apologies. We did not uh, believe this was going to take this long. Otherwise, we would have tried to inform you in advance Perhaps you could have come later, but mm -hmm. I think you might have found uh, the preceding uh, enlightening at any event. So uh, I don't know which of you would like to proceed first. I'll, um, I'll, I'll lead off. So. If you would identify yourselves, we appreciate your taking the time to come and, uh, and uh, give us your insight on this very, very important issue. Uh, I'm identify Paul Friedenberg. Uh, I'm currently at Baker and Botts. I was the uh, undersecretary for export administration in the Reagan administration. Yes. So I was... Uh, it, present at the time the original decision was made to uh, allow the Chinese to uh, uh, launch American satellites. I, I, before I, uh, I'm going to have a very brief discussion of it, I know the hour is late. Uh, one perspective that hasn't been uh, put on the table is that we no longer have multilateralism. When we say stop, that's us stopping. There are other advanced industrial countries and we have gotten rid of COCOM, and the new organization called Vasanar, uh, which nobody knows, can pronounce or knows where it is, is so obscure and so weak that it's worthless in terms of, in terms of dealing with technology transfer. In fact, in forming it, the administration particularly stated repeatedly that it was not to deal with China. It was to deal with the, uh, with the uh, rogue nations. Well, if there's no international organization to deal with China, there's no rules to deal with China. How do you get other countries to uh, agree to stop transferring technology to China? That's impossible under the current structure. 
It just, there is no lever for us to do that. Um, I would be very brief by saying that when we made the decision in the Reagan administration to allow the, the uh, Chinese launch of American satellites, we recognized that there was, uh, there was some danger, there would be a risk, uh, but we, we thought it would be, the technology transfer part of it would be containable. Uh, we had no idea that it was going to be a long-range policy, and that's one of the real problems you have. Because we've had, we thought it was going to be short-term, there would be American alternatives to that launch. And you know there's a great demand for satellite launch capability right now. It's booked up through the year 2000. So uh, that is a, that's a problem we in America haven't dealt with. And in fact, I'm currently dealing with two uh, clients who are going to be American alternatives, inexpensive American alternatives to Chinese satellite launches, but they're only going online the end of this year and next year, and we really haven't had an inexpensive alternative, uh, and that's why uh, the uh, uh, satellite company has been turning to the Chinese and uh, the Russians and French and others. The Chinese is because the uh, expense is about a quarter of the U.S. launch cap uh, expense. It's a very inexpensive way to do it uh, relative to the U.S. Uh, launch capabilities. We had essentially the Mr. Cadillac Chairman, or the Rolls-Royce version. We didn't have the Volkswagen version, and now, and now we're going to, but we didn't have it up to now. I do wish it, have interrupted you. I'm sorry. Go no, ahead. I just want one question. The, uh, I understand the reason we go to China on those, because we don't have the capability to put all those satellites up there. Is that so? Yeah, well, we don't have it at a reasonable price uh, for, from the point of view of the satellite uh, companies. They want to get it the cheapest possible. And, uh, that, and, and given the fact that there, is, there are foreign alternatives, we haven't developed it. Really, there's only recently that entrepreneurial capital has been raised to do that. But we really didn't have that alternative. So essentially, what was seen as a short-term policy in 88 has become a long-term policy. And I just wanted to point out there's two consequences of that. And that has to do with what we believed and what I think is probably true for the, for the time we've done it. We could contain the technology transfer. In fact, it was a two-way technology transfer. We learned about the Chinese, too. There is something about, uh, about going there and looking at their uh, missiles uh, that they launch our satellites that helps us as well. But there were two problems that developed. One is we were providing the Chinese with money, and we were providing their rocket manufacturers with money. That's inevitable. We gave it money in other forms, but we were giving it to a ministry that, that builds rockets. The second thing we were doing is providing them with experience. The way you learn to build uh, effective rockets and or missiles is through a period of, through a, a learning process. The learning process comes from repeated launches. We were providing, we and others were providing those repeated launches. That's inevitable. There was no way you could stop that as long as you were using the Chinese. That's a long-term policy that I'm not sure, when we talk about intelligence failures, we're talking about a long-term policy that was really a policy failure. We weren't thinking about what we were doing, and, and short-term policies, as frequently the case, become long-term policies. That's happened. Now, we, as, we, as you look at it, as this committee looks at it, they ought to look at the policy uh, as, as, in terms of just general, how do we want to have our satellites launched, what alternatives are there, what kinds of consequences are there. Um, now, uh, as I say, you need to have the, you, really, in terms of this committee's um, very broad uh, mandate. The two things that ought to be looked at is what are the alternatives? How are we going to have what is becoming a satellite age, an age in which we're going to fill the, 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 the uh, outer space around uh, Five, the Earth numbers. with <laughs> endless numbers of satellites? How are we going to do that? How are we going to do that in a reasonable way? Has the congressional policy been encouraging of that? That's, that's one question. The second question, I think, is if we are worried about technology transfer to China, and it's been pointed out all these things that have happened, what are we going to do about that? When I, I was recently in, in uh, Japan talking to Japanese officials, they said, well, we'd be happy to talk about technology transfer cooperation with, uh, with regard to China, but nobody talks to us about it. Uh, we have one very successful tech transfer agreement with the, China, with the uh, Japanese, and that's the supercomputer agreement, and it's worked well at the very high end. Now, it doesn't cover low end technology. It covers only the very fastest supercomputers. Uh, that's worked well, but we haven't expanded that, and we haven't, as far as I know, even attempted to have an, a multilateral organization to deal with tech transfer. We gave up on that in 1994, and there's been nothing to replace it. 
I'll leave it at that point because I know the hour is late, and I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you very, very much. And uh, now we'll proceed to uh, Joel Johnson is next. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I'm Vice President uh, International of the Aerospace Industries Association, which is the industry association that represents most of the U.S. manufacturers of aircraft, satellites, rockets, helicopters, and the stuff that goes on them. Uh, we welcome the beginning of this uh, uh, select committee in, in that, uh, as has already been made clear today, issues such as export controls, technology transfer, and foreign launches of U.S. satellites are indeed complex ones. They're not easily explained in TV broadcasts of two and three minutes. Uh, we believe that the select committee, as well as the other investigations going on in the Congress, as long as they're fair and balanced, will increase the detailed knowledge of the Congress and of the American public as to how the export control system works. And they'll also determine what did and didn't happen with respect to Chinese launches of U.S. satellites. I personally believe at the end of the day we're going to find out that the system worked as the Congress intended and that there were no significant compromises to U.S. security. In fact, on the contrary, I think you're going to find that there were net security and economic benefits to the United States. Let me just touch on a very few points, because again, I know the hour is late. Uh, as more has been alluded to several times, we operate two export control systems in the United States, one under the authority of the Arms Export Control Act, administered by the State Department. Uh, items are placed by the Secretary of State on something called the munitions list. I think the very titles, Arms Export Control Act and Munitions List, imply what Congress had in mind, weapons. Two decades ago, the Congress passed an Export Administration Act, uh, which, while it expired several years ago, is still implemented as if it were in existence. That act was to control so-called dual-use technology, that is, goods and technologies that have legitimate commercial uses but also have military applications. That, of course, is admitted by the Commerce Department, which maintains a commodity control list, analogous to the munitions list. That sounds simple. However, each time technology originates in the military sector, and migrates to the commercial one, we go through similar bureaucratic battles to the one we've seen on satellites. Uh, I, when I first got in this business, the issue was over inertial navigation systems that were embedded in commercial aircraft such as a 747, and you needed a munitions license every time you sold a, a 747 for that reason. We have other examples of, include currently night vision equipment. I even remember the struggle of getting bank teller machines off the munitions list because they have an encryption algorithm for their own security. ATMs were indeed a munitions item for a number of years. It was precisely to deal with that kind of issue that the Export Administration Act was created and the dual use, uh, uh, to control dual use items. When these struggles occur, uh, you find out that they involve both substance, they involve turf, they involve personalities, they involve ideologies, and occasionally, dear God, they involve politics. Uh, <laughs> none of these are easy, and they tend to extend over a very long period of time. We see a similar process in the co commerce arena as you remove technologies from the commodity control list. We see this in computers, for example, where a half-life of a computer is about 18 months. I like to remind people that if you look at Apollo 13, one Apollo 13 was mostly done by engineers with slide rules, which have long since been off our list. And uh, I think the bulk of the total computer power in that control room wa was uh, uh, less than a Pentium laptop, which most high school kids have at their command today. Things come off the list as it becomes impossible to control them. Satellites were no exception, as has been said innumerable times today. The process began under President Reagan, was continued under President Bush, and continued under President Clinton. There seem to be several confusions to this process, which I hope the Select Committee may address. First, moving a product from state jurisdiction to commerce jurisdiction doesn't decontrol it. It changes the criteria for control. Secondly, commerce jurisdiction does not involve lower-level technology, but rather dual-use versus military technology. Criteria for controls is not easier under commerce, it's different under commerce. Let me give you an exam, a couple examples. For example, the Arms Export Control Act, the overarching reason for control is not technology but foreign policy. There will be situations where we will not sell small arms to a country, which are very low technology, but we will sell air defense equipment to a country. Technology is not the number one and only criteria for arms export control. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a more powerful driver, actually, in the commercial commodity control list. Um, 
if we look at satellites for a moment, there's, again, there seems to be two issues involved here of which, again, we see some confusion. First, there's the question of allowing Chinese launches of U.S. built satellites. Secondly, there's the question of selling U.S. satellites to the Chinese for their own use, that is, in orbit. Sometimes those two come together where we launch a U.S. satellite for the Chinese. Other times we're launching a U.S. satellite for the use of other countries or international consortium. On the launch issue, let me say, note that a U.S. satellite manufacturer or communications operator is basically hiring the Chinese to do a job, to deliver a satellite to a specific orbit. We're hiring a moving company we are, that has a truck. We are not providing a school for moving companies, and we are not designing trucks. Our business is to tell the guys to put it in orbit. Uh, and I would repeat, therefore, we are also not selling satellite technology, and we are not selling rocket technology to the Chinese. We are buying a launch service. Very different. What do we tell the Chinese about the satellite? Just about what we tell a moving company. How big it is, what it weighs, any special handling it requirements, when, where and what it, when we want it delivered. But not what is in the box, e.g. not what's in the satellite. That's not what we sell. That's not what we provide the Chinese. Now let's look at satellite communications. The Chinese market to us is a very interesting one, obviously. The Chinese, unlike the, the West, unlike industrial countries, isn't hardwired. You don't have copper and fiber optics anywhere near the degree you do. As they advance economically, they are going to be required to have, make a, have a much higher dependency on satellites sooner than we did historically. Uh, that's a, it's, a, it's a good market. But more importantly, I think, or equally importantly, politically, as the Chinese get more exposure to world news, as they get ideas and philosophies through the international media and the internet, and indeed as they just talk to each other on phones which are not controllable by a central government authority because there's too many of them, uh, I think we will see the Chinese uh, politics and culture change. And a driver to that will be the satellite, communication satellites that they have at their disposal. So what's the problem? We know that for the past 10 years, three presidents, several secretaries of state and defense, and innumerable professional government employees have monitored the export control system related to satellites. We know Congress was notified of every satellite waiver. We know that our companies have extensive compliance and export control systems within those companies. Um, to implement the licenses given by our government. So, so, I mean, did everyone take leave of their senses sometime in the last 10 years? I, I, I strongly doubt that. Is the system proof, foolproof? No, that's not good, the case either. Of course not. Human beings run it. That's why the Arms Export Control uh, uh, Act and the Export Administration Act both have penalties as well as rules. Uh, but to use another analogy, if there's an allegation that a driver breaks the rules, you neither suspend the issuance of driver's licenses nor abolish the motor vehicles department. What you do is you find out if there was an infraction, you punish any crime, and as a last resort, you alter the, the driving code. And I think that's what will happen with this and the other investigations. Again, I suspect at the end of the day, you're going to find the law was adequate, that hundreds of civil servants, political appointees, elected officials, and yeah, even industry employees did their job as best they could. If there was a slip-up, as appears to have been the case in the Laurel situation, in which, let us again remember in that case, Laurel turned itself into the State Department. Let us remember that it was the Chinese didn't ask, didn't voluntarily want Western help with their rockets. They were bludgeoned into it by Western insurance companies. And let us remember that we learned far more about their capabilities by examining their report than anything they would have learned from us. Um, if there was a slip up, then let's see if it was individual carelessness, was it confusion, was it confusion of the rules, or is there a systemic process problem that needs addressing? Uh, we in industry stand more than uh, willing to help both the select committee and any other congressional committee looking at this issue to get the facts on the table and decide what, if any, changes might be useful. Thank you. Now we have John Pike. Uh, if you'd like to go ahead, your entire table will appear without objection. Take whatever time you need. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here this afternoon and also appreciate the lateness of the hour. We so we'll try to get everybody out of here. Uh, the approach of selective engagement followed by the Clinton administration lacks the simplicity of our consistently adversarial policies of decades past towards China 
is it requires a difficult balancing of diverse interests. But given the choice between the challenges of seeking the proper balance and the far greater risks of returning to outright confrontation, there should be little doubt as to where American national interests lie. Over time, our current engagement initiatives may fail, and despite our best efforts, we may in the 21st century confront security challenges from China that may rival those posed by the Soviet Union, but it's far too t soon to conclude that that moment is at hand and surely premature to abandon efforts to averse, avert that outcome. Concerns have been raised about the potential for American technical information to be used by the Chinese to improve the accuracy or reliability of their ICBM force. There's no indication that, that this has in fact happened, and there's little reason to anticipate that it will happen. I am concerned that in the absence of rapid and significant reductions in American and Russian nuclear arsenals, China may over the coming decades build up to American current force levels and develop an appetite for high confidence and high reliability of its strategic forces. Hopefully, we can forestall this development, but should we fail, we will not confront a Chinese arsenal of liquid-fueled DF-5s, but rather more numerous arsenal of the newer DF-31s and 41s, and certainly any insight into the reliability of the DF-5A gained in the 1990s would be a vanishingly little reference, relevance to the reliability of the utterly unrelated DF-31 that might be deployed 10 or 15 years hence. The set of policies pursued by the last three administrations and generally endorsed by the United States Congress has strengthened the American satellite industry, enhancing our global dominance of this strategic sector, and in the process, increasing the diversity and capabilities of communications available to our military forces worldwide. It's engaged the energies of the Chinese aerospace industry and moved them towards seeing space development rather than missiles as a central focus of their growing role in the world. It's given us leverage in discouraging their transfer of special weapons technologies to other countries, notably Pakistan. And while these efforts have clearly not been as successful as we would have wished, our non-proliferation sticks would have been even less effective in the absence of the carrots of space cooperation. We should not allow current controversies to obscure the fundamental soundness of these policies, and we should not allow the current controversy to distract us from the more pressing and significant challenges to American security interests today. Thank you. Thank you uh, very, very much. Uh, Mike, and, uh, let me uh, again apologize for having kept you all so, uh, so late. Uh, there, I had a couple of questions I wanted to pose to you, but I think uh, there is a vote taking place right now. Uh, and rather than keep you here for another hour, by the time we can get back, uh, if it's all right with you, we'd like to submit questions to you and perhaps uh, uh, have you get them back for the record. Would that be all right? That'd Welcome the opportunity. Uh, Thank we, you. Uh, we greatly appreciate you taking the time uh, to, give, to give us your testimony. Mr. Mobley, did you have a question? No, I just want to say hello to John. It's been a long time since we worked, we worked together. Yes. Good, good to see you. <laughs> you look great. You're looking good yourself. Here it is. <laughs> a welcome addition. <laughs> more ways than one. Mr. Gus. No, I want to thank the witnesses very much. It was very useful. And uh, we had uh, some introduction to some of the things Mr. Johnson testified to this morning from the GAO. And uh, we're learning a lot about the regime as this thing goes along. And uh, one of the questions I think that's going to come out of this, or one of the truths that's going to come out of this, is a reexamination of policy, which may be a good idea because things seem to be moving so fast. Sometimes I think our policy doesn't quite catch up with technology, and it's beginning to look to me like we may be in that position. We you probably passed an act in a te decade. Yeah. There hasn't been an Export Administration Act since 1988. Well, your point that this was a short-term policy, maybe that started out as a short-term policy, is now because it's that many years later, it's now a long-term policy. Right. It registers upon me. But, and your fact about the American ability to get out and compete and sell and uh, hold our own is pretty good, uh, as, as is yours. So I, I appreciate everybody's contributions. Gentlemen, again, yeah, thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. The, uh... Coming up, House Minority Leader Richard Gephardt and others discuss their opposition to the Tax Code Termination Act, a bill to replace the nation's tax laws. After